Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, April 16th, 2019 Select Board meeting. Uh, we know the meeting has been properly warned because we entered into executive session at 5 o'clock this evening. Um, first up, we will approve the minutes from the April 2nd meeting. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Um, chair's remarks. I have no remarks for tonight outside of <coughs> just thanking so much participation for coming to the meeting tonight. Um, and I'll turn it over to Peter. Do you have some remarks? I also evening? don't have anything outside of our agenda items this evening. So. Great. Are there Thank other you. members of the board that have committee reports or remarks? I'll make a remark. Um, some of you might have seen that uh, Christina Nolan, U.S. Attorney um, up in, for Vermont, uh, came and visited us and did a great um, press release about some drug arrests that happened. Um, we were able to meet with her, and, uh, and she praised a lot of what's going on in Brattleboro, um, including a lot of prevention efforts and a lot of what... Project CARE is doing through the work of our police department and a bunch of agencies. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that, that there's been some progress both on the arrest side to our uh, continuing uh, drug addiction issues we have here in town. Um, and uh, an incredible coordination happened with the federal agencies and uh, state and local agencies. And uh, it's a positive thing for Brattleboro and an ongoing effort that we're uh, on top of. Thank you, Tim. I appreciated the way that they worked in the law enforcement angle and the way that they were able to understand um, the severe lack of treatment availability and the systemic issues that face people who are struggling with opiates, including lack of housing and other systemic barriers. So it was a good meeting indeed. Anybody else on the board have a report to give from a committee or remarks in general? No? Okay. At this time, I will open the meeting to public participation. This is a time in the meeting where you can speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody who would like to speak on something? Franz? Hi, Franz Reichsman, District 2. Uh, there's been recent news out of Washington that um, the president and perhaps others in his administration are proposing to permit asylum seekers to come to sanctuary cities, uh, otherwise unidentified thus far. Uh, I don't know if that's ever really going to happen, but I'm hoping that if it does, that Brattleboro will be well positioned to accept some asylum seekers to uh, incorporate into our community. Um, I don't think there's anything to do about it right now, but I just want to express that I think many people in town would welcome that sort of opportunity, and I, I hope it actually does happen. Thank, Thank you. you, Franz. Anybody else want to speak on something that's not on tonight's agenda? Okay. Then we are going to move into our role as liquor commissioners. I would be seeking a motion to convene as liquor commissioners. I make a motion to convene as liquor commissioners. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries 5-0, and we are liquor commissioners with our first one being $3 Dewey's doing business as McNeil's Brewery, and this is the first class liquor license renewal. Here. Yes, so um, you'll remember that earlier this spring you looked at the um, full list of um, uh, liquor licenses that were up for renewal. Um, there were two that were identified as needing further review. Um, one because of a violation where the um, prior board actually was the one who had looked at the renewal and the prior board asked that um, the organization that had had a, a violation um, citation during the year come and explain what had happened with that and the remedial action they had taken. That happened and that one has been approved as well. Um, and the one other one, and the one remaining one at this point, is um, for McNeil's um, Brewery. Um, and that is um, related 
to not the actual paperwork um, related to the, the liquor license itself, but rather related to some safety issues that were identified at the property that need to be remedied in order that the town can actually um, uh, recommend the approval of the liquor license through the liquor process. So um, if you need more information about that from town staff in greater detail, um, Lenny Howard is here um, from the fire department who's been involved personally in the matter related to the life safety issues there. Um, as well as in communication with state officials about those. Um, the, there is progress being made, but our request to you tonight is that um, if you do decide to approve this, that you approve it conditionally, um, with the condition being that all the different life safety issues be um, resolved prior to the issuance of the liquor license. Thank you, Peter. And I should note that Mr. McNeil is here tonight, and if select board members would like it, we can certainly have them come up to the table for any questions that we might have. Sure. Yep. Ray, would you come up to our side table here? Over there? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Okay. Is there anything you want to say um, to the board or <coughs> the public before we launch into any questions that we might have? Uh, we are we needed to uh, do some repairs to our sprinkler system and uh, the some electrical work in the building and we have done that uh, the sprinkler system is at this moment fully operable and uh, we've spent about ten thousand dollars on sprinklers and electric in the last mm. say five weeks okay. uh, the electrical work I would say is maybe 75 percent complete the electrician's supposed to come back next week and i think he'll finish it then okay great thank you for that information do members of the board have questions for ray uh, i would just ask are you feeling pretty confident that uh, by may 1st you can have everything done and uh, reinspected uh can we have it done by may 1st yes i think we can have it done by may 1st can we have it reinspected? Um, I have no control over that. I'm not the inspector. Glenn's nodding. Lily well, says yes. Good. Anybody else on the board have any questions, no. comments, or concerns? Okay. Okay. So it looks like what we're looking at doing is voting to renew this license. Um, with the condition that everything be up to snuff and inspected by May 1st. Is everybody comfortable with that? And if so, would somebody make a motion? I'll make a motion. Great. Uh, to approve the renewal of the first class liquor license for the for three dollar Dewey's DBA McNeil's Brewery on the condition that sprinkler system repairs pass inspection by the Brattleboro Fire Department no later than May 1st, 2019. All right, Tim has made a motion to approve the renewal of the first class liquor license for $3 Dewey's uh, DBA McNeil's on the condition that sprinkler system repairs pass inspection by the Brattleboro Fire Department <coughs> no later than May 1st, 2019. Is there any additional discussion on this item? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Ray, Thank for you. coming. Thank you. Okay, our next item under liquor commissioners is the strolling of the heifers Friday evening street festival, um, Friday night festival at the River Garden. And we have Orly and Ann, if you'd like to come over to the table. Hi, thanks Hello. for joining us this evening. Hello. Great. Is there anything you want to speak to before we go through our Just list of stuff? The title is no longer the Friday Street Festival. I wondered about that, yeah. which is why I said so, it with kind of a strange yeah, voice. <laughs> you went and corrected after, so it's yeah. a yeah, Friday <laughs> Festival. Yeah. Right. It's the kickoff, so it's just not on the street. Yeah. So there are changes we can talk about. But this is just about the liquor. This is just about the liquor license that, right now. And that is as it always has been in the River Garden. Yep. Great. We have and great uh, food, specialty food people, as well as um, 
wonderful selection of um, alcohol vendors. Um, and as people know, um, the distillers are adding value to um, the farms, um, and it's really helping in that way as well. So um, it's really showcasing what our farms have to produce. Is there anybody new on this list of alcohol vendors this year? Vendors who have not come in prior years? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Hell's Gate is new. They did come to a one-off event. Um, um, the other one is St. John's Berry Distilling and okay. Wild Heart. Okay. Those are three new companies we haven't worked with prior. Great. Yep. Okay. It's all in order. Great. Okay, so we are looking at approving licenses um, or a license, and it's going to include Wild Heart Distillery in Shelburne, Vermont Distillers in Marlboro, Saxons River Distillery from Brattleboro, J and J Farm LLC doing business as Hell's Gate Distillery from St Albans, White Mountain Distillery LLC doing business as Stowe Cider from Stowe. St. Johnsbury Distillery from St. Johnsbury. Charles Dodge doing business as Putney Mountain Winery from Putney. Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery from Brattleboro and Caledonia Spirits from Hardwick. That's it. Members of the boards have questions or comments on any of this? Yeah, I got a question. <laughs> um, is this event one that will be inclusive? So if you don't drink, um, but you're with somebody that does want to enjoy one of these vendors, will there be options available for those people? Great question. Yes. We have several. It's We're calling it the Specialty Food and Vermont Beverage. So there are other Vermont beverages. Um, there's a Switchel. There's other non-alcoholic um, sodas, alternative drinks, and specialty foods. So to get into their a roped off area for the alcohol vendors and each of the vendors knows that they need to check IDs we also have someone pre-checking um, before people go in there um, last year it worked well where we shut off the back deck so people can go sit with people with cocktails on the deck they're still in a, a supervised area um, so that way they can't take their drink down around the corner and they can't walk out the building they, they're in this area so anyone can join them with a drink um, and we did let children in with fam with parents to sit at the tables, but we were very careful that, you know, the... People... We have many volunteers who keep an eye. Yeah. So it's small, nine vendors. It, it's very manageable. Um, and then there's a lot of food vendors as well and yeah. um, uh, non-alcoholic beverages as well. Okay. Other members of the board? Do you want to save the sort of unveiling of what your new plan is for the later mm -hmm. oh, yeah. agenda item? Okay. Unless you want us to. Just, mm -hmm. I'm trying to me. tease it so that people <laughs> stay tuned. Ah. Stay tuned. Because we lose our audience. Let's Don't call it. <laughs> Are there members of the public that would mm -hmm. like to ask any questions about, specifically about the nine vendor event that takes place in the River Garden for strolling of the heifers? Okay. Seeing no questions or comments from public or board, I would entertain a motion. I did the easy one. I know. I'm not allowed to make motions because I'm the chair. And so you can't just say so many because it. Some people already... I did the minutes. Yeah, okay. All right. I'll, I'll do it. I'll get it out the way. Um, okay. I move to approve special event permits for the following vendors for the portion of the strolling of the heifers. Friday evening festival to be held inside the River Garden on June 7th, 2019, between 5 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. Wild Heart Distillery, Inc., Vermont Distillers, Inc., Saxton River, Saxon's River Distillery, J&J &J Farm, LLC, doing business as Hell's Gate Distillery, White Mountain Distillery, LLC, doing business as Stowe Cider, St. Johnsbury Distillery, Charles Dodge, doing business as Putney Mountain Winery, LLP, Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery, and Caledonia Spirits, Inc. Great. Daniel has beautifully recited a motion that I'm not going to repeat, but he 
move to approve a special event permit for nine vendors for the portion of the strolling of the heifers Friday evening festival at the River Garden. All those in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay. <laughs> Well, actually, I shouldn't have really dismissed you, huh? Well, this is West. Yeah, that's West. One more. Well, this is different. Okay. Good and good. Okay. So our next is the Saturday night outside, or Saturday outside catering permit for 45 Linden Street, and that is Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery from Brattleboro. If you guys would like to come over to the table. And we are taking a look at approving a catering permit, um, which will be in conjunction with the strolling of the heifer parade. Thank you. Gentlemen. Hello. 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 Would you like to tell us a little bit about your setup and serving plans for Saturday, June 8th? And to introduce themselves? And introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm James Brannigan, Brewery Operations Manager and Event Coordinator for Whetstone Station. Mm -hmm. And I'm David Heiler, co-owner of Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery. Great. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, give a quick shout out to uh, Orly and Ann for the work that they do every year to put off, pull off this festival, which I think is just an incredible thing that happens for Brattleboro every year. And I know that it's a 365-day year job. Um, We've been very proud to be a part of it every year in some capacity, but usually just from a, you know, uh, serving it at different uh, events that happen around it. And this year we're very excited to be uh, hopefully a part of it, um, having the Rolling Stone, our food truck and beer truck out uh, as part of the event. Um, and uh, yeah, we just want to say thanks for that. So uh, this is the first year, I think, that uh, there will be any sort of beer served at, this, at the festival. And um, we feel like we're good, responsible vendors and business here in town that, that can pull this off well. I think we've, we've proved ourselves in a lot of uh, different arenas over the past few years as, a, as caterers. And uh, this event will allow us to have our food truck um, on the parking lot of the law offices at 46... Linden Street, thank you. And um, we'll actually uh, create a little beer garden section. Um, we will use our food truck to serve food and also have our, our beer uh, end of the truck serve beer as well. And uh, we'll have a cordoned off area which will be uh, double fenced. And we'll have a uh, ID taker at the beer stand and we'll have someone standing at the gate uh, to ensure that people don't leave the area with beers. Um, what we'll I think, have ID bracelets as well for that, people who you. have um, been checked. And I think the nice part about it is uh, we felt very excited about this because the next to us in the uh, municipal parking lot there will be NECA, will be doing performances. So it really creates a nice little beer garden area. People can eat food and uh, have a beer while they watch the NECA festivities. Uh, I believe uh, so far Mocha Joe's has also agreed to be within the confines of our little section as well, creating a little bit larger space and providing some other uh, alternatives to, to what we're serving. It sounds really great, and it looks like you'll be serving from 9 to 5 on that Saturday. <clears throat> I think, I think it, or, yeah, I mean, I think we're allowed to serve from 9 to 5. It's, it's when, I have a when things start. Mm -hmm. Did I get all that? Um, yes, you did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's unusual to start serving beer and wine at 9 a.m. Is, is that it's, your practice? Is, is it's not our, our, our goal necessarily. It's, it's basically to, to, uh, it's to, four, it's to 4 p.m. I think we, we, you know, allow the licensing to, so we can set up, so we're, you know, we have all our, our uh, items available, but that's not our, necessarily our practice. It's what, it's the application. Is so. it possible to differentiate between the food that's being served and the beer and wine so that the beer and wine is served at a later time? Sure. I mean, yeah. we were planning on serving later in the morning. I just wanted to make sure our permit was set up so that we could be serving food as early as possible. Okay. Uh, I know that vendors are supposed to be, supposed to be set up by 9. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. So I started based on their guidelines for vendor permitting to start the permit at 9 on our official permit. 
But if you prefer, we can certainly delay our alcohol service until later. <coughs> well, let, let's talk about that because I would prefer that. I, I you know, obviously, you're different from the other vendors, mm -hmm. and um, I would think that we'd want to start more like. 11 when the parade is done that seems more appropriate to me to have people come to the parade with their children and so forth and after the parade is done allow alcohol to be served and, and our only thought on on it a lot of it is set up is making sure that we're set up and prepared and so you know if beer is being poured at any time we feel a responsibility to the department of liquor control that if we if we're you know pouring or testing or if there's beer coming out of those taps that we feel that we should have it licensed so um, you know again our intention is not to serve until you know uh, till till later in the morning or until you know things get going but I, we just didn't want to limit ourselves to having to wait to set that up and start testing taps or tasting making sure things are okay so 11 sounds fine to you really just I mean I, I would prefer if it were 10 at least just so we yeah. can cover our bases mm -hmm. if you know again we're not we don't serve at our restaurant we don't serve anywhere and, and you know no beer comes out of the taps until you know 11 30 when we open at the whetstone but again trying to get set up and be ready to go yeah. just feels like we'd like a little bit of leeway there I think setups is fine really I mean you have to need to bleed the taps or something like that well you know we get make sure that the car you know the carbonation yeah. everything's right that's coming out of the taps and we yeah. taste it and you know. um, but again I mean I, I'm not so we could stipulate that you could set up and then well, they serve to, yeah. later they have to be set up for nine period um, my only thought is I think most people probably aren't gonna buy beer at them. like I don't know that we want to legislate that that's my, it feels a little well, icky. Well, I think there's some uh, baseball I mean, games that are a little uh, iffy. Baseball's boring. <laughs> Says yeah. you. That's me. <laughs> right um, I, I don't feel like it's our crowd. I mean, we don't, we don't, it's yeah. not like people are going to rush over to grab a well, beer at 9 a.m. It's not, we've never been that way. We don't open the restaurant that early. And, we, so. but this is new. Right, agreed. And this is the first time that liquor's been served okay. at this venue. Hello, my name is Ivan Hennessy. Um, I'm a certified server in Vermont. I work at the store and we're 30. Um, just as an interesting little trivia note, your standard liquor license um, allows a uh, uh, business to start serving at 8 a.m. and to stop at 2 a.m. Thanks for So, right. If it's not an issue for a standard business, perhaps it's not an issue for a special event. Thanks, Ivan. Daniel, I think you had a comment or question. Yeah, both probably. Um, I'm sober for about five years, and I know a bunch of people in this town who are also sober. And and it kind of it goes back to my question about inclusion um, about the Friday night festival. You know, I know a lot of folks who will hang out with somebody that wants to go and get a beer, and they also need to feel welcome as well. So I just kind of wanted to make sure that there are options for people that don't want to drink alcohol um, but want to hang out in this you know pleasant setting um, and then I had a question a really basic logistic question are there going to be bathrooms in this kind of zone I think there usually yes. are yeah. yes usually yeah do. okay good because <laughs> 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 and, and to be honest I'm going back to the kind of the timing thing you know um, I'm from the UK if the pub is open in the UK people are in the pub um, if the bar is open at nine on a day that is unlike any other day of the year, I expect people will be at the bar. Um, I love the parade. I love the kind of family-oriented nature of the parade. And I hope it doesn't get too sloppy. But, you know, far be it from me to say you can't have your beer. You and, and again, and I, if, you may, if I may just answer that real quickly, I mean, I, I feel like if you if you know our establishment and you know the way we do business, I mean, we are just not a we're not a hard drinking place, and I will never tell you that that we haven't had people that have crossed the line, I suppose, um, but we take that responsibility very seriously. You know, we we care about the product that we serve. We consider ourselves to serve a very high quality product, um, and it's not it's not meant to drink and get drunk, but yeah, it does have alcohol in it. Um, and again, we, you know, 
it's on our insistence that we have somebody that stands at that, you know, stands at the door and make sure people doesn't leave. And we, we want to ID each person. We don't want to hire somebody to do that. We want that to happen at the beer garden um, so that we're in total control of that process all along. So we have very strict laws about, um, you know, shutting people off at the restaurant if they've had too much. And, um, so, I mean, I, I hope that, you know, you'll have confidence in us that we, we also care about that. I wanted to reiterate what David Could just you introduce yourself. I'm Ann Latches, uh, strongly of the heifers and also 30 year in the beer business having attended umpteen million beer events where I had to set up in the morning and it really helped when we could have our setup and be able to test our kegs and sure one or two people might come by and if the liquor inspector was there you would get shut down if your permit said you can start at 1015 and you even so much as pulled that tap. Uh, so I think it's important that the license allow, the permitting time allow, and that David be trusted to start serving when it, it feels appropriate and to the appropriate people, because that's what his license covers. So, thank Thanks, you. Anne. Anybody from this side of the table want to speak? Sure. I'm trying to keep it balanced. No oh. pressure. You guys don't have to. Oh, they do. <laughs> they do? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. That's how I do it. rule with an iron fist. I no, I'll, I'll just say that uh, it is a, a sort of a new thing. And of course, we're trying to be careful and do our due diligence in Understood. our roles as liquor commissioners. Um, I'll just say personally that I've seen these guys operate and many different things. Uh, Harris Hill Ski Jump, uh, the food truck Roundup, um, they're very good at what they do in controlling crowds and serving responsibly. So. Uh, had it been anybody else I wasn't as familiar with, I'd have many more concerns. But uh, I think I'll stay out of the question of the. I don't have a strong feeling about the when they should start. I, I think that's kind of my sense too. It, it, it just seems to just subjectively choose an hour and say that this is the, the right time to start. I think if we find there's trouble this year, then we'll know. You don't get, but, we don't um, get to come back. I I, yeah, I don't have any basis to say that 11 is better than 9. I just, I don't see that. And Elizabeth, if it makes you feel better, I mean, we share your, you know, if, if people start drinking at 9 a.m., I mean, we, we, you know, tend to have a pretty jaundiced eye towards those people. You know, they're not going to hang out until 5 p.m. at our in our space, and I can guarantee you that's not going to be something that we could know. Yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to hear both you and Anne talk about that whole uh, uh, setup time that's required. I was unaware of that. Okay. Any further questions or comments? So at this point, we are voting specifically on item C as it's presented. After we do this vote, if somebody wants to present another option, such as a time frame, then we would do that as a separate vote. So at this time, I would be looking for a motion um, to approve the catering permit. It's actually from 9 to 4. Is that right, Ann? The expo ends at 4. We ask the vendors to start to be packed. Yeah, so we don't want to have the 5. So that would be like one thing just for all of us to know. Does anybody want to make the motion? I move we approve a catering permit for Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery of Brattleboro, Vermont for Saturday, June 8, 2019, in association with the Strolling of the Heifers Parade. Okay, David's made a motion to approve the catering permit for the Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery for Saturday, June 8, in association with Strolling of the Heifers and rem reminding members that this is as presented, which would be licensing to do whatever they're doing from nine to four. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thanks very much, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Excellent. Come visit. Oh, I'll be there. Absolutely. No, not at nine. <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere at nine. Okay. At this time, I would take a motion to adjourn as liquor commissioners. I move to adjourn as liquor commissioners. All those in favor of adjourning as liquor commissioners? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And I would take a motion to convene as water and sewer commissioners. I'll make a motion to convene as water and sewer commissioners. <laughs> well, you're in a rhythm there. Keep, keep it rolling. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Excellent. 
Okay, with our first topic up being the Main Street Water Main Replacement Project, the big thing happening in town. Peter? Thank you. Um, Steve is here and can speak to details that you may want to know, particularly um, going beyond the ratification of the bid award that we're asking you for tonight, but if you have questions about how the project's proceeding, you know, it is a high-profile location and we've had a lot of communication with the public around this. Um, but you'll recall that um, two weeks ago tonight, we asked that you delegate to me the authority to award this bid so we could keep the project moving in an expedited manner. You did do that. Um, we received just one bid, um, but it was thoroughly vetted by both the engineer who had designed the project, Dufresne and Associates, and by um, Steve and the team at Public Works. Um, and they validated that it was an appropriate bid from a, um, a contractor who is well-versed in that Work, working in the town and particularly in that part of the town of Zaluzny who um, actually did the sidewalk project that is in that you know, on that east side of Main Street a couple of summers ago um, and has done extensive work for the town and in the town previously so um, based on the validating of the pricing and based on the fact that um, the contractor was known to be well qualified to us we did go ahead and award to the sole bidder um, in the amount of $178,143, and we ask tonight that you ratify that decision. Great. Steve, do you have anything you want to add before the board takes up discussion? I don't. Uh, I, I will add one thing is that we did put this on the Vermont bid list, and yeah. that is a, a resource for Vermont contractors to be uh, listed on and so when we posted this job it it automatically gets sent out to contractors that are in this type of work so we we had hoped because we were expediting this process that that uh, we may receive additional bids but we didn't and i think logistically zaluzny being so close with his supplies um, that made a big difference too on whether people could compete with him mm -hmm. makes sense thank you for that members of the board have questions or comments about the ratification of the award of the bid to Zaluzny? So, Zaluzny. You're, you're in charge of that. <laughs> Thanks. I have a, uh, well, I, just a comment, I guess, because you can't do too much about it, but it, it is a little more expensive than we expected, right? Yeah, our original estimate was about 150000 and um, there's a lot of factors here. There's a concrete road underneath has nine inches of concrete, um, some cobblestone in areas. And then there's another five to six inches of asphalt. And then besides that, in the 300 foot section, there's about 11 services, sprinkler services and smaller lines. So there's a lot of work in this small congested area. And traffic control is also a big factor um, that elevates the cost. So I feel pretty comfortable um, with the number. And I guess we're not gonna know because we didn't have other bids, which is unfortunate. You always like to see competitive bidding. But in this case, we felt that even the engineers did too, that you can't, it's hard to really put a number on this one. Especially given our time crunch that you're really trying to get it. The time was enough time to, that's why we asked the board to give us the authority. The contractor that we talked to felt that it was more than enough time to complete the job. So, but I think to expedite that advertising time, if it, maybe if it could have been another week or two weeks, maybe it'd been better. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Other members of the board have questions or comments? How's it going? Mm -hmm. It's going pretty good. Um, you know, we've had a, a few things, uh, communication situations where um, the other night we had to go down and uh, we installed a new valve, the utilities division, so we had to shut the water off on a section of Main Street. And there was a couple residents that weren't aware. You know, they didn't they didn't get our uh, emails or contacts. So we've tried to uh, improve on that to increase our list. And anybody out there that uh, is watching this tonight, if you want to be included in the press releases, just let us know. Either contact the town manager's office or Public Works, and we'll add you to the list. But today was successful. They made the connection onto the existing 12 inch and disconnected from the 8 inch water main, the old water main, um, on the southerly part of the street. And they got a length of pipe in and a, a valve. So now we're off and running um, up the street. Any other questions or comments from the board? Just a quick ancillary question. The uh, blinking light situation, 
a couple of people have mentioned to me, uh, it is a little bit tough when you're on high making that left, especially. It's a, we are, we're asking for all due courtesy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen a lot of that out there today. I spent a lot of time there today. And, you know, you'll hear 50% of the people said they should always be on 50% will say, they, it's, boy, it's the greatest mm -hmm. thing that they're on flash. Um, but respect and letting people out, we've seen a lot of that, and I think it's important that people are using Main Street and you see High Street backed up. I witnessed it several times today. People would just stop and give courtesy and let people across, and pedestrians too. Mm -hmm. So, And when there's no work going on, when there's no real blockage of lanes or anything, or diversion, can we turn it back on? We continue to leave it on flash because oh. the excavator takes more space than a normal parking space, and it's jetted out into the road. And so when we first tried that, we saw where there would be a tractor trailer, and then when it did was uh, they couldn't make it through without getting into the turn lanes. Uh, so if you're coming up Main Street, they had to get into the high street turn lane, and so that caused problems. So we've decided that we'll, we'll stick to the, the blinking and um, see how that goes. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Anybody else on the board? Anybody from the public want to have a question or a comment about the Main Street water pipe replacement project? The ratification of a bid? Not feeling it. Okay, then I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. All right, Liz. To ratify the town manager's bid award in the amount of $178,143 to Zaluzny Construction of Vernon, Vermont for the water main replacement project on Main Street. All right, Liz has made a motion to ratify the town manager's bid award in the amount of 178 143 to Zaluzny Construction of Vernon, Vermont for the water main replacement project. <laughs> All those in favor of that motion? Yay. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up. Under our water commissioner duties, we have the second reading of an ordinance amendment <coughs> public hearing on Chapter 18, Water and Sewer sewer Rates. <coughs> you and take it away. this is your second reading. You know from um, when you first looked at this and approved that we bring it forward in this manner, and then when you saw it two weeks ago tonight for first reading, that um, what's before you is an ordinance that will maintain the existing water and sewer rates for one additional year. So um, the specific wording is that the sewer rates contained in section 18-137A through C that are effective for July 2019 shall be continued in full force and effect until June 30th, 2020. And uh, we recommend that you give it your formal final approval. Um, it is in accordance with the um, procedures related to adoption of ordinances. It's a public hearing, so it would be appropriate for you to declare the opening of a public hearing and ask if there are any public comments before you move forward to a discussion and vote. Great. Thank you so much. On Peter's advice, I'm going to open it up to the public. This is a public hearing. It's convened. Does anybody have any discussions on the select board basically not raising water and sewer rates this year or for the next fiscal year? Sean. Good evening, Franz Reichsman from the Finance Committee. Um, so I, I don't know how many of uh, the general public or viewers, etc., um, are aware about the enterprise funds and what's similar to and what's different from other spending by the town. Uh, so the parking fund the utilities fund and I guess the solid waste fund are all to some extent independent of the budget process that we all just went through culminating in town meeting. Um, and in fact for the enterprise funds the exclusive control over the budget lies with the select board and it does not come before representative town meeting which of course is where the finance committee comes from. Um, nonetheless uh, it seems to the Finance Committee that under the Town Charter it's appropriate for us to review these budgets and we haven't been doing so in recent years but we are anticipating doing so um, this year, next year. I mean plans are still somewhat up in the air since the new finance, the new improved totally awesome Finance Committee has not yet <laughs> had its first meeting 
um, which will be tomorrow. Nice. So um, I, I, you, we're a little bit late to the, the game, but I thought I would stand up and say a few things tonight. Um, first of all, I'm not sure exactly what the process is going to look like over the coming year for the bigger review of the utilities budget. Um, I also don't know exactly what's going to happen with the other two enterprise funds, but the utilities budget seems like it's going to be the major action for the coming year. Um, so uh, we and I imagine other people might be curious about what steps you see being taken and what kind of time frame and where people will have access to the process. Um, so that's just kind of a general overview thing. Um, and the, the other big area of concern is that the cost for the population, for the people and businesses in town have gone up a lot in the past five years. Looks like something like 35 percent in five years for the sewer fees and uh, 10 percent for the water fees um, aggregated over the five-year period. Uh, and a lot of that is because of the sewage treatment plant. Um, However, the, the information that was distributed in preparation for this meeting didn't go over the expense side. It did look at, at the revenues and the, the fees going up every year, but I couldn't get a, a good sense of where the money's actually going, how much of that is to debt payments on the sewage treatment facility and stuff like that. So there were some unanswered questions. <coughs> um, and also the, the other big question is, you know, we've had so many discussions about fund balance and debt in the general fund budget that I'm wondering how the board sees that and the administration sees that in the current context where there's actually roughly a $5 million fund balance, uh, which seems like a lot. Uh, not to say there won't be an opportunity to spend it coming up pretty soon, uh, but how that sort of fits into the overall picture of where we're headed um, with the utilities budget and how much money is going to need to be raised uh, for the projected improvements in the water supply division. So those are the issues that uh, the Finance Committee well is stated. worried about right now. Great. And uh, any response would be appreciated. Great. Peter, how do you feel about fielding that? Thank you. Sure. So. Um, that's a lot there. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh he oh. forgot. <laughs> Quick, shut off the mic. <laughs> um, the other issue is that there is overlap in the general fund budget and the enterprise fund budgets. Um, certainly, well, I think in all three of the enterprise funds budgets, there, there are times where money goes back and forth mm -hmm. in both directions. And exactly how that is allocated or expensed is not something that I've ever seen either. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So let me take the last one first. There is a formula, and we can speak to that during the upcoming um, enterprise fund budget process um, so that you and the other members of the public can better understand um, that the formula and the basis for it. Um, that's for generating the, um, the number that is uh, the transfer from the enterprise funds to the general fund, which is a payment that um, offsets the costs for the services that general fund employees provide to the, the uh, enterprise funds. So there's, for instance, you know, all the payroll processing and a variety of other things that are done, and actually um, some facilities uh, costs as well that are shared. So um, we can provide detailed information about that when we present the, the budget information coming up. Um, as far as opportunities to learn more and be involved in the process, um, in the near term, the proposals for the FY20 budgets uh, for the enterprise funds for the year that will begin on July 1st will be presented to the select board um, for initial consideration at the second May meeting, which is May 21st. Um, we expect that at that meeting and at least the next one after that, the first meeting in June, probably at the May 21st and then both meetings in June, we would expect there might be further consideration depending on you know, the pace at which we move through uh, what will be a, a fairly significant amount of information. Um, so that's when looking at the details of a one-year perspective um, will be available. We'll go through our annual process. You're right that that one gets a lot less scrutiny generally from the public than uh, the general fund budget. We'd welcome, you know, meeting with the Finance Committee ahead of that May 21st meeting and or having, you know, fuller participation of the public in the, in the process for those enterprise funds. Um, and then you also mentioned the sort of bigger review um, of the uh, 
utilities fund. And in fact, yes, we do plan that. That was the background context for taking a year off from rate increases is um, there is a significant project that will fit into um, the broader scope of other capital work that needs to be done related to the utilities fund, um, which is the um, either significant reconstruction or replacement. And as we get deeper into the planning, we lean more and more towards replacement, but we don't yet have a recommendation to offer um, regarding the water treatment plant. So the water treatment plant that was um, first put online in 1989 is at the end of its useful life. And um, so that's gonna be a significant expense, not as great as the $30 million worth of sewer system work that was done with the major expense at the uh, wastewater treatment plant, but other work in the system as well, um, but still a significant um, you know, multi-million dollar expense. And, um, and so because the scope of that is not well-defined yet, we're still working on those plans, um, we, believe that it's appropriate to maintain the $5 million balance. Um, and we are able, the projections for this coming year is that we're in a financial condition where we're, we're able to project maintaining that balance, not drawing down against it, even without a further rate increase at this time. So you accurately stated that the increase on the sewer side has been significant in the last five years, um, less so on the water side, because the work that we're paying for now was that work that was done on the sewer side that's likely to, to be reversed when we come forward with information in the fall um, after doing additional work related to the planning for the water treatment plant and additional work related to the rates and the forecast for the coming years. Um, we'll be presenting information in the fall to the select board, uh, again, welcoming public participation in that, um, that will enable the board to make a more informed decision about what the rates need to look like over the next several years in order to um, pay for that significant improvement to the water system and other capital improvements that are needed for the, the utilities. So um, we, we had thought previously when we had communication around all of this about a year ago that we might be farther along than we are in the planning for the water plant, um, which would have put us in a position where some of those larger decisions might have been being made right about now. Um, instead, we anticipate um, addressing them in great detail through the fall and into the winter. Um, so that there's plenty of advance notice for when decisions are made in the early part of 2020 for implementation in July of 2020. Thanks for that, Peter. How's that feel, Franz? Yeah? Right now. Good. good. Good luck at your meeting tomorrow. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions or comments on the board, off the board, regarding this second reading? Okay, then I'm going to close the public hearing. Did you take a breath like you wanted to ask a question? I I'd always want to offer color commentary. and uh, Great. But I, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> but you, if, 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 <laughs> if, if anybody's interested in it, I mean, there, there is a healthy uh, debate on the board uh, as to how much of a reason, because you mentioned the, the close to $5 million. So, I want everyone to know that there's a there was about a year ago a healthy debate as to how much should be built up, um, and we debated actually if we were continuing with the fifth year I believe of the increases that were pre-scheduled, um, that did uh, end up happening, um, which is why I'm especially happy to hold them for a year, uh, and a little happy about the break that we can all sort of look at things. Um, but there, you know, so we have a big project coming up. Uh, so the question is, uh, how much uh, cash would it be? Would it have to be bonded? We just we don't know those questions yet. But you rest assured, we welcome the public and the finance committee's uh, advice. And Thanks for adding to that because it made me See, now you it, it reminded me that I want to remind anybody that doesn't remember that long and thorough conversation that our primary goal, and I think Peter, since he came on board, is to avoid usury. Uh, to avoid having to pay interest as much as possible. And that's why we continued that fifth year and why we'll be looking at it really carefully. And Franz, I welcome your uh, oversight to the whole process and your narrative ability to help us understand it or articulate it to other people at least. Just one quick clarification. So um, the relationship between these different pieces that we've been talking about, um, we don't know for sure what the water 
project is going to entail yet, the full details of that, but we know that whichever way it goes, the cost is going to substantially exceed $5 million. Um, again, not be as expensive as the work that was done at the uh, wastewater treatment plant, but still be a very large scale, very expensive project. And so um, it made sense to us, staff made that recommendation, the board did approve a year ago that we continue through the final year of the prior rate ordinance, um, maintain that $5 million balance so that we had a starting, uh, you know, a, a, a pool of cash to start from in paying for the upcoming project. We likely are still going to need to borrow some amount of money in order to actually implement it, but we'll reduce the amount of borrowing and reduce the overall cost of the project by um, maintaining the healthy fund balance in the meantime. Okay. Right. Nice restraint. At this point, I am going to close the public hearing, and I am going to be looking for a motion to approve the amendments to the Brattleboro Code. Um, I'll make that motion. Great. I make a motion to approve the amendments to the Brattleboro Code of Ordinances, Chapter 18, Water and Sewers, as presented. Wonderful. Liz has made a motion to approve the amendments to Brattleboro Code of Ordinances, Chapter 18, Water and Sewer, as presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I would at this time take a motion to adjourn as Water and Sewer Commissioners. So All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Motion carries. And we move on to unfinished business. Represent, so at this point we're going to be talking about, well, let me back up. Many items came out of representative town meeting, many that were non-binding. Peter is always good enough to make a list of those for us so that we remember them after the thorough meetings that we have at representative town meeting. And tonight we are going to be discussing item number four, and that is the $100,000 that representative town meeting approved for energy efficiency and or sustainability. Um, so that's where we're at tonight. Um, are there members on the board that would like to speak to this? I would. That are wearing a blue shirt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I thank the rest of the board for uh, postponing this for two weeks. Uh, for the first time in six years, there was conflict between the school district and the select board meetings. It's the, and it's only because it was an Act 46 meeting, not a school district. But it won't happen again, and I'm very grateful because this is a project that keeps growing. And even though I think what what came from the representative town meeting is all we need to continue the the process forward, I wanted to make sure that um, the board was aware of the scope of um, what, what we're thinking about. And I'm glad to see Michael Bosworth and Oscar Heller here. And I wonder if if I could invite them to come sit at the table you so may. they could offer mm -hmm. comments and thoughts as we go along. Would you be willing to do that? You guys are into yeah. it. You can come right up to the table. And actually, I did that because, Michael, I was wondering if you would explain a little bit the background of the star chart, which I understand is now no longer in, um, in vogue. It's been replaced with an improved version. But this is... Um, this gives you a sense of the difference between a sustainability and um, just an energy coordinator and a sustainability coordinator. Great. And you'll see things like housing affordability and transportation uh, and, and quality sure of living and preservation and all kinds of things. It's a very broad task that we're going to be looking at, a job that we're going to be looking to fill. So I can say a little bit about this. Can you guys introduce yourselves so that people know why David might have invited you up? <laughs> yeah, I'm Oscar Heller, chair of the Energy Committee. Uh, Michael Bosworth, uh, I used to be chair of the Energy Committee. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, there are um, two different ways that uh, towns have gotten into staffing work around this uh, area of need. One is to hire energy coordinators and another is to hire sustainability coordinators. And energy coordinators, I think, are more narrowly defined, working just on energy, usually working just on municipal projects. Sustainability coordinators get into other things beyond energy and a lot of things that are related and sort of take a more global look at uh, town's sustainability needs. So it, it is a fundamentally different type of um, of position 
Now, um, and the, the chart you have before you sort of gives you some indication of, you know, a bunch of different things you can get. A sustainability coordinator and a sustainability initiative can get into, and uh, cities and towns uh, who have one or who have such an office do get into a lot of these things. Uh, I know at town meeting, representative town meeting, the wording was not this specific. The wording says energy efficiencies or, or, and or sustainability. Correct. I think there were a lot of sense from representative town meeting members that they want to see some staffing to support this, but I don't think necessarily all the members even knew, you know, are, are they supporting an energy coordinator, sustainability coordinator? So this uh, can really address a lot of needs. I think um, Patrick's report to the select board from a year and a half ago now, or more even, uh, pointed out that uh, he didn't feel like our town needed an energy coordinator at this time, at that time, but the idea of a sustainability coordinator had a lot of, of appeal from um, his point of view. So that's um, another reason to look more closely at it. We have made contacts with people uh, nearby, uh, Northampton, city of Northampton, uh, town of Greenfield, uh, city of Greenfield, I should say. They have sustainability uh, staff, and so we can learn and have learned from them. And uh, there's other, uh, they're spread throughout New England, other, other examples of that. So, um, and uh, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that an energy coordinator may be able to more quickly uh, affect the bottom line of the town by looking for savings. The sustainability coordinator, in my mind, is a lot more important town-wide because it would potentially work with private uh, building owners, private uh, homeowners, uh, businesses, uh, along with the town. So, you know, how you want, how uh, any municipality defines the function is, uh, is an important thing to, to, you know, to agree upon what the, the function should be. Um, uh, I've said a lot, so I'll, I'll let Oscar say a bunch now. <laughs> oh, well, the only things, the Energy Committee at our recent meeting discussed this. There has been a position vacant for a while for a part-time energy coordinator in town. We are recommending that the town shift focus entirely, not really try to fill that position anymore. I think a bunch of different people think that for different reasons it doesn't really work. And we prefer the town focus fully on the sustainability coordinator position and also the general recommendation that this $100,000 be reserved for that use until either the position is filled and we know there's money left over to spend on other energy and or sustainability things or until we find out we can't find the position that we can't fill the position and the money's freed up but that we we just like it to be a, a single point of focus and not spend the money in other places until that's dealt with so the single point of focus being the salary. sustainability yeah exactly and you don't seem to have this chart that we have not Do you have on this? me, but, but I've seen so I've this seen it is before. what you're more in favor of versus energy coordinators. What I just want to clarify. Oh yeah, I, I, I don't want to talk to the energy committee, but why not? Okay. Yes, so, so this weird. isn't bingo. You want to find a person <laughs> not winning anything tonight yeah. to uh, fulfill all of these roles. No, I think if you look, yeah. at the, and I didn't go, I didn't go cross out all the things that uh, are on there that we already are have going on in the community but a lot of things like community water system uh, public park land waste minimization um, energy efficiency greening the energy supply water efficiency business retention we have organizations that are working on a lot of these mm -hmm. already very deeply involved in a lot of these yes. so it really is a, a matter of the community deciding or determining not necessarily these specific things but what what really does sustainability mean okay so I look at this chart and I see urban planning. As a licensed, uh, certified urban planner, I know that uh, 
sustainability is a major element in the profession. And so I would s suggest, and I heard it offered before, that this position be uh, in the planning department of our town government. Yeah. That's um, one of the models that we, s that we have yeah. seen. Yeah. Because, you know, many of these things really overlap the work that the planning department does yeah. and can augment it in the specific sustainability ways. Um, I know when we were working on the town plan, sustainability was a major factor. And so um, in coordination with the planning department, I think the sustainability coordinator could go a long way towards the goals that we all share. Can I piggyback on that? Because yes. when I look at this, you know, with my <laughs> lens and experience and whatever context, you know, I, I look at the equity and empowerment column, which says civic engagement, civil and human rights, environmental justice, equitable services and access, human services, poverty prevention and alleviation. So when we're talking about a sustainable Brattleboro, I would like to think that it would include many of those things, if not all. Um, my question actually more really is about process though. What, what is the process we're talking about here? Because this was funds that town meeting um, approved for use on energy efficiency and sustainability at the, and or. okay, yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, at the select board's discretion. Um, so, um, you know, I, see Oscar and Michael here and I respect the work that they do and will continue to do but I also do wonder like what is the process that the town is moving forward with yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want before anybody yeah. speaks does, do people want to pass this around so you know what we're talking about I crossed yeah, off my notes words, yeah. <laughs> there you go it's just I just feel bad having something other people don't have don't like that. Yeah. okay you guys could just pass it amongst yourselves and share it thanks Yes. Yeah. Tim, that was actually the, the yeah. first point. Peter's going to speak in. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'd, yes. I'd like to explain just the, the process that we're proposing, but okay. if you want to go well, the, first, that's um, fine. There are two, two, two parts of it. I'd like, I'd like sure. to, it, Daniel's, well, Daniel's comment was, was my third, I have three points here. The first okay. one is, here's the scope we're talking about. The second one I'll tell you later. I'll take it out of, out of turn. But the third part was an inclusive process. The sustainability is also about resilience and it's about it's about okay. uh, creating public meetings inviting people to, inviting different constituents to come and talk about what is it that we need to have to sustain this community and it, it could be something as massive as we if, if irene came through again only stronger and took out an interstate bridge and a bridge to to uh, new hampshire and we couldn't get any food for a few weeks or fuel where would we all go to sleep where would we get our, you know, those kinds of, that kind of sustainability for disaster, but also sustaining the people that have come into this room several times and talked about the way the town is not fitting, uh, meeting their needs or that, that, have, that have challenges and, and um, issues that we're not, we're not dealing with, and housing being the most commonly heard example of that. So having a, having a, a really broad open process that doesn't just say come up, you know, we're having a public meeting, come on in, but actually goes out and seeks out those constituencies, the people in your 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 concentric circles group, for instance, and uh, and really make it make it an inclusive process rather than <coughs> just similar to the the job search that we're mm -hmm. we just processed through. So that's when I think about the process, that's the that's the way I'm thinking of it. And then there's the formal process that we already <laughs> talked about, you know, yeah. is in, kind of in place. So. If it's appropriate, I'd like to speak to the decision-making process as opposed to the implementation mm -hmm. process yeah. because it, there's some work that needs to be done that gets you to the threshold of um, sort of which path to follow. Um, and um, that's what this paragraph four in the memo from a couple of weeks ago speaks to. Um, the There has been ongoing work in the community from two gentlemen at the table as well as others in the community who have an interest in this. Um, uh, I don't know the full extent of that yet because um, we had some discussion last December about that. Um, 
I didn't think that there was um, sufficient definition to the position at that point for us to add it to the budget. So I suggested to the select board that instead the folks who are interested in this from the community keep working on it while we completed our budget process at town meeting. Um, and then at about this time that um, I would re-engage with the folks from the community who have been working on it. And together we would work on developing what, what does the sustainability officer position look like if the town does indeed proceed to create it. So that together from, you know, with the interest from the community as well as the um, sort of perspective from town staff, we'd be able to you know, provide information to you, the board, during the summer of 2019 for you to decide, do you wish to create this position? Um, at the time, the thought was you would then give us direction about whether or not to include the position in the, the proposed FY21 budget. Um, but because of the additional funding that was provided at town meeting, um, it positions the town to be able to potentially move forward right away if you do want to create the position. Um, there is a decision that the board will need to make when you have more information in front of you about the sustainability position and um, our perspective, collective perspective on um, how it might provide the best value to the town, you'll have a decision to make about whether you wish to create that position or whether you wish to invest the $100,000 in other aspects of energy efficiency and sustainability. And so that's, we envision over the next few months um, developing that scope of this position in such a way that you'd be able to make an informed decision about this sometime in the middle of the summer. Great, that was very clarifying. And there's no action required tonight. This is That's really correct. a conversation that we're beginning. And as we can all see, the scope of this extends probably far beyond the five of us sitting at this table and even beyond the seven of us sitting at these combined tables. So we will, Peter will not let this come off the radar. He plans to keep moving it. Like Actually, I have a meeting scheduled so for more, next week. One more specific thing. David? Yeah. The, um, the legislature, this is a kind of works against what you just said, not necessarily, but uh, about saving it all until we make that decision. But the legislature just passed, uh, I'm sorry, the House, the Energy and Technology Committee with a 9-0 tripartisan vote uh, passed a bill um, to form a new position at the Department of Public Service and grants up to 60,000 for municipalities and communication union districts, which we don't have here. We don't have a communication union district, at least right. not that the regional commission knows about. Um, but for municipalities to develop business plans for reaching all their residents with technology capable of 25.3 or better speeds. 25.3 isn't really a very good speed in terms of competition across the country. That's pretty good for Vermont. But there's $60,000, up to $60,000 grants, and the governor's budget has a loss reserve back up for $1.5 million of Vermont Economic Development Authority loans and statutory changes to make it easier to bond with private providers. And so I would like to suggest for, I don't know if we can make it in action tonight because it isn't on the agenda, but I'd like to um, have us talk a little about, about having our staff explore the uh, the possibilities of getting that grant and looking into a bond to to um, start exploring the, the possibility of uh, fiber, uh, running fiber to every business and, and home in the town. Thank you. Sir. I don't know if we have a grant seeking department or, and I, I'm not sure that it's been through the Senate and that it's actually available yet, but um, I'd like us to yeah, start I'm, looking I'm at it. I'm certain it hasn't been finally adopted yet, but um, we could put that on for the May 7th meeting if you'd like additional information. We wouldn't be in a position to right. you know, propose a grant application at that point, but we right. could at least bring additional information Great. about what um, what's happening in the legislature and when there might be an opportunity to Great. pursue it. Great. Thank you for that. Further on this item, or are we going to table this until the next time it comes up, which is going to be very soon? Table. Well, table. Oh, Tim, please. I, I just wanted to throw out there that um, I, I'm really seeking uh, sort of us, if we're going to talk about this issue, I want to step back and first acknowledge what we have been doing as a town for energy efficiency and sustainability. Um, and, and not throw all the work that's been done already from, and I understand that, that so this town has done a lot of work since we did a, a study in 2016, and this only encompasses uh, municipal building recommendations. Um, but I wrote a letter to the editor pointing out that there's 
been a lot of money spent, and it, you could argue that it far exceeds, you could definitely argue that it far exceeds $100,000 per year. Um, and so what I want to see is that how would this position actually help the town, not just by paying somebody a substantial amount of money every year and paying for their benefits and creating a new position, but I want to see how does this help the town. Uh, it'd be great if it could save money through efficiencies, of course, um, but how does it help, help the world if that's one of the concerns that we want to wrap into this position. So. I'm, I'm cautioning and, and saying let's, let's take our time and make sure we understand what we're talking about because this chart was just presented and it's the first time I've seen it and um, it seems to be this idea of a sustainability coordinator seems to be sort of this vacuum that, where a lot of people's ideas kind of fall into it and then it becomes, in my word that I used last time we talked about this at length, was squishy. It becomes very sort of amorphous to me and I, I need to understand how this position would be an improvement on our existing hard-working town employees and what they're already doing through a lot of these areas, whether it be planning, um, the town plan, a planning department, uh, you know, uh, Patrick's work and all the work that the committee has done uh, with or without an uh, energy coordinator over the past few years. So. I guess I'm just urging that we uh, understand what we're talking about before we barrel forward with suggesting a, uh, a new position because frankly we just, you know, we went through a lot, we're still going through a lot looking for a good HR position and that, that's a new position of the town and it has a very clear focus and it's a very important position for this town. So I guess I'm, I'm looking for those community um, partners to come in and really have a broader discussion on, on why this uh, position is necessary for Brattleboro. Great, thank you. That's great. Yeah, so just to say that, I mean, the first step will definitely be research and drawing up the job description. The Energy Committee will be involved. People from the community will be involved. Town staff will, I'm sure, have the final responsibility for yes. that. And then just I think the people who propose this at town meeting, none of them, well, some of them may have had specific job descriptions in mind. They probably all didn't have the same job description in mind. But I think what they all agreed on was that they wanted the town's focus to shift a little more in this direction. They wanted the town to invest slightly more. They wanted a new position that would focus specifically on some of these issues. So I think. I don't know, I took that as a pretty clear directive from town meeting that they wanted more resources applied to this problem. Obviously, the position still has to make sense and it still has to be well thought out, but um, I don't know, I, I think I agree with the people who put it forward to town meeting and voted on it that it is, these are important things. And even though many of them may be already being tackled by different parts of town staff and different organizations, you can always do more. And I think it seems like the town would like to do a little more. So we're going to try and put together the best job description we can and get something really good. But And then the final thing I'd say is that I know this isn't directly disagreeing. I don't think you were saying the opposite of this, but there are going to be some things on here that save the town money. But there will be also things where the returns are not financial but um, still important and there might not be an immediate financial return so it's um, I also want to just be very careful about how we measure the success or failure of this position sure like the quality like of life or yeah exactly yeah. Definitely. Yeah. hard to measure okay and I also just wanted to ask do you, is there a public discussion segment of this? I know there's no action taken, but there were also some people who Here's I think up. came to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Spoon. Can I ask a question? Oh wait, first? sorry, Daniel, I didn't see you. Um, who is currently involved in this work? You, you talked about we and how people can get involved, and I'd just like to know who and yes. how people can get involved. Great. That right now, the only thing other than town staff, the energy committee has a working group. I'm on it, Tom Franks, another energy committee member is on it. We are not the people officially drawing this up. We, of 
you know, more or less of the Energy Committee's initiative have been approaching town staff wanting to help, wanting to offer research, but I met with some other people earlier this week and I wanted to make it clear to them and everyone else, this isn't the only official channel for people to get into this process. But if people are interested, some of the people I've spoken to and the rest of the Energy Committee will be at our next Energy Committee meeting where we'll have an agenda item to discuss this work group. Particularly, it will be May 13th at the community room, at the, uh, the co-op community room at 5 p.m. <coughs> and people are, you know, it's an open meeting. Everyone's welcome to come. We welcome the participation. But also, just any group or any person can go to town staff or the select board with their ideas, et cetera. It's not a closed process. This isn't the only way in. Great. So. Did you say 5 p.m.? 5 p.m., May 13th. Which Monday. is a Tuesday, I think, or Monday. It's it should Monday. be a Monday. <laughs> Hopefully. Otherwise, I have the wrong day. No, it's Monday. <laughs> okay, Spoon. Spoon Agave. And um, I'd like to reiterate, as, as I said uh, from what I was saying at, at town meeting, that we are in ext extraordinary times, that we don't know how close we are to, we don't even know what kind of disasters from the melting um, frozen ground, where they call that at North and the release of methane, Permafrost. to plastics in the ocean, to the uh, pollution in the air, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every day you read the newspapers and your heart sinks. What we need now, what is needed now from the select board is leadership. That is being able to recognize the, the, the energy, the interest, the eagerness of a pretty fair number of people around this town to get involved and at, on a uh, uh, on a very serious basis and level, and 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 to open doors, to ease the way for things, to speed things through, to guide things. That's what leadership is about, and to avoid procrastination from uncertainty, because there really isn't much that can go wrong that in any way comes close to what could go wrong from pro procrastinating, from not doing things. So I ask, I know there is a groundswell among the people as, as concern and apprehension and fear about the future begins to grow. And that's, that w that's a lot of energy. And, and it's going to need guidance and assistance in every way. And I do hope that you put fears aside and take some chances, make some tight d deadlines, move things along faster, ask where things are when they're not on your desk, and see, I was actually hoping we would have a person on the job j j July 1st when the year started. That's a little bit of pie in the sky, I yes. guess. But, um, that, but, but because we couldn't meet that kind of a goal doesn't mean that there's no goal. August 1st, September 1st, but it need, we need to get somebody on board soon, as soon as possible. Thank you, Spoon. Further public comment? Hi, please come on up to the microphone and introduce yourself. Uh, Tony Duncan. Um, I want to like strongly reinforce what Spoon was saying. Um, I think one of the problems with this is that this is an incredibly huge crisis that we're facing that we don't see you know, evidence of on a daily basis. This is something that 
you know, possibly Irene was was the beginning of something like that that's had a tremendous effect on this community, and you know, people have seen that destructiveness. There's no way to know exactly what it is, but we do know that from the science, as well as we understand it, that the destructive consequences of climate change can be just absolutely devastating. So there's the possibility of real, real devastation, and we have right now an administration and. Uh, frankly, we have a political party that for the vast majority is denying that this actual crisis that almost every scientist who has an honest uh, take on the issue and who's done research on this says is potentially devastating. So um, I, I want to just reinforce what Spoon was saying that I think it's really important that communities, and we're in a position now where this small local community can actually say that this is a really big deal. Um, I'm certainly open to the idea of, of other ways to spend the money um, to, that could be valuable, but my personal belief is that having a person who is in a position of authority, who has the ability, and again, I don't know exactly what the job description would be, what that authority would be, um, you know, what uh, Elizabeth was saying about being under the Planning Commission makes a lot of sense to me, but having a, a position installed you know, as quickly as possible. And I, I would encourage again, you know, again, I do not know, you know, what, what, what it would take to, to have this happen, but if it would be possible to, to do what we could to actually have a person in place, you know, by July 1st or as soon as possible, I think, for one thing, in my point of view, is a, a, a very important symbol saying that the, the community, the, the government and the, the citizenry take this extremely seriously and that we actually have to start dealing with this. Um, there are a number of issues, there are a lot of questions that I think would need to be you know, addressed. Um, that chart is kind of daunting about how many different issues are involved and I think they're all related. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it makes sense to hire someone who's going to say, well, we're gonna deal with all of this. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, certainly I'm absolutely willing to, you know, put my time where my mouth is about this. And I think there are a lot of citizens available, the way Spoon was saying too, to, to put in, you know, whatever time and whatever help is needed to give resources to the Energy Committee or to whatever else to help move this as forward as possible. Great. Thank you, Tony. Further public comments? Franz. Franz Reichman. Uh, in most of this country, I would be considered a flaming radical and a crazy left-wing <laughs> liberal snowflake, wow. et cetera. But in Brattleboro, I find myself being the voice of reason and the old guy conservative who gets up and says, don't waste this money. There may not be any risk in spending this money to the world at large, but I think there is a risk uh, of prematurely beginning a program that then does not succeed. So I think everyone who voted for this, and probably a lot of people who didn't vote for it at town meeting, definitely want to see it succeed. So if it takes you a little longer to put something in place that has the best possible chance of success, I would urge you to go that way and not just start throwing at a money that's money at a problem that's still ill-defined and the solutions are conjectural. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak? Otherwise, I'm going to let Tony have another turn. Okay, Tony, come on. Um, I absolutely agree with what you're no. saying, and I, I want to make it clear that I don't, I don't think we should rush into this and just do anything. Um, I think it would be foolish to spend this money, hire a coordinator, and not have him be effective, him or her be effective. I think it's absolutely vital that we really look at the concrete issues to assess, you know, whatever the current situation is, to examine the things. Um, that Tim was talking about and what we already are doing and acknowledge that we have been doing stuff and that it is important and valuable. Um, but I think it is, um, I think it is absolutely important that we make sure that what we're doing is really going to work, be effective and be a model for other communities to, to use. So I certainly am not encouraging um, doing anything in a way that's going to be um, 
that isn't going to be well thought out or isn't going to be effective. I think it's vitally important that it be effective and that the uh, you know that all the concerns about whatever it would take to do this be be considered. I absolutely want to make it clear. I, I don't think we should rush into doing something that's going to end up being unproductive, but I do think we need to try and rush as well as we can, as quickly as we can, in order to accomplish, um, to use this money which is now available and, you know, with, with due diligence. Thank you. Tim, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, um, I'll speak for myself, Anthro anthropogenic climate change is real. That is, climate change is being partially caused by human activity. And I think if you look at this board, you don't see anybody up here who would dispute a very well-settled science. So despite this tendency of our, um, some media, I'm not going to pick anybody out, but to present this sort of argument as, well, is it real or is it not real? That's, I think, a ridiculous thing, way to present it. Um, so I don't think if you've been watching our meetings and you've been paying attention to our election, you definitely see uh, five select board members who, who believe this is a real phenomenon. The real rubber hitting the road is how can we as a very limited resourced community affect change? And I, speaking again for myself, I am not going to throw money at any kind of feel-good activity. And that might, we might feel really good if we have a sustainability coordinator who is thinking and talking and making some actions about climate change in general. But if, if I don't see how that's really going to be an effective tool for our world and for our community and for Brattleboro specifically, I'm not gonna vote for that because I don't think that's leadership. I think leadership is making the hard decisions of what makes a difference for our community, all of our members of our community, and not, forgive me, Tony, but not a symbol. I don't want to spend money, our taxpayer money, on symbols because we spend enough money on real things, and this is all I'm asking for. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. David? Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that this this isn't new. This is this has been done before in other places. There are lots of models that we can look to. Uh, there are lots of structures that we can look to for advice. And there are a lot of people in this community that understand how to affect change, how to coordinate efforts, and how to work with people, and a lot of, and and, and um, create things that are successful. I wouldn't vote for what you described either. I, I haven't heard anybody describe that or, or ask for that. So I think it's important to point that out. We, this is not. It's not like we have to invent the wheel. The wheel is already in place. We just need to tune it to our needs and to what would work in this community. Spoon? I'm not trying to change the world from here. Not directly, anyway. I think what we're trying to do is Number one, learn how to reduce our own environmental and uh, uh, economic and whatever impact, unsustainable impacts uh, to the greatest degree that we can here as we live. And along the way, observing very carefully what's going on in the world and how that affects us, how, how uh, uh, migrations and, uh, and climate conditions, etc., actually do affect us and develop responses to that uh, uh, in, in terms of housing, in terms of all, all sorts of things. So uh, it's, not, it's not, and this is what we need that, that, that professional for, is to be able to bring in to us uh, all the things that are happening all around us. Now, hopefully, uh, if we can get into this very deep, we'll be inspiring. Putney already has its trans, uh, transitional town thing going, and hopefully what would become a, a sustainability 
uh, effort here in Brattleboro becomes a regional affair, and then maybe a state affair, etc. But that that gets way out of our control. But I think we have to do everything we can for ourselves and learn how to be prepared for whatever we might imagine and agree is c coming our way. Thank you, Spoon. Daniel? I want to give a shout out to like town staff that have been paying attention to what's been going on in our world. Um, particularly, I'm thinking about like Steve Barrett and the Public Works Department. Um, Steve has made comments in the press that have been about seeing the impacts of um, you know the changing climate and just make it you know just a reminder that actually all of the town staff and department heads are like responsible professional people who are doing a good job right we have planning and environmental impact studies and all that kind of stuff um, and I you know I've spent a reasonable amount of my time doing climate activism and um, I don't think that anybody needs to worry that this board is going to just kind of um, kick this can down the road. But I'm also not I'm not going to vote uh, in favor of something that is ill-defined or seems like, you know, poor use of taxpayer money. So I want to see like a really good proposal. Um, and I want as many people who have a stake in it to be involved in the process of crafting it. Thank you. Okay. Ricky? Hi. I would love to hear when people talk about budgets to uh, trust and be secure that there is enough money because uh, especially with how the representatives approved over five million dollar five million dollars to be saved into banks to accrue interest uh, there is no lack of funds, especially when uh, such a surplus is being taken away from what we should be working with. Um, part of a healthy economy is actually being in debt, investing into public works, and that stimulates and stabilizes uh, true, truer uh, economic equality. Uh, rather than us uh, have to, um, that's all, yeah. Thank you, Ricky. Okay, I don't know how people are feeling, but we are not going to take action on this item tonight. You're going to be working on your end of it. Peter's not going to let it come off the radar. We'll be talking about it again soon, um, and we should probably move on through the agenda if everybody's feeling satisfied for this moment anyways, knowing that there's ample discussion on our way. Yeah? yeah thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. At this time, we are now moving into new business. And the first item we have for new business is strolling of the heifers, parade and open air permits, and that includes the permit for the Friday night festival on the common, the permit for the Saturday parade and expo, and the permit for the Sunday tour to heifer. And Anne and Orly, would you like to come back to our table? Excellent. Okay. All right, so we have applications in front of us, so we know the nuts and bolts. Is there anything that you want to kind of summarize for the viewing audience and the seated audience? Sure. Um, so um, the strolling of the heifers, as um, many of the viewers know and the people here, it's more than a parade. Uh, the Parade and Festival is a fundraiser um, that um, helps us run all the wonderful programs that we do year-round, uh, such as the Farm to Table Apprenticeship Program, where we train people who are underemployed and unemployed um, for three months and uh, uh, work with them on attrition, on early job skills, and of course culinary. And Tristan Tolino is a teacher. And I'm proud to report that this year we are working hand over hand with the Bravo Retreat and providing in the program a therapeutic coach. And um, we're very excited uh, uh, to have this pilot project in progress. 
uh, and we're very excited about that. Uh, the other piece that we have is Wyndham Grows, where we're scaling up small businesses. Uh, we've already worked with 40 businesses, have created many wonderful new jobs uh, due to the growth of these small businesses um, in our area and some um, in other parts of Vermont. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and of course the River Garden every single day has um, all kinds of um, activities, uh, Monday through Friday, and viewers, if anyone has something to share, like a lecture, or you've got some entertainment, um, you can sign up for a brown bag lunch by calling the River Garden or stopping by and uh, sign up for a 12 to 1 session. Uh, it's a lot of fun and I invite all the viewers to come. Um, and we are also a job working site uh, for the Department of Labor, Voc Rehab, um, um, other programs that send us people who are um, learning about early job skills and it has helped many many people in our community so we're very excited about our little community and opening the doors at the River Garden um, we also are very excited about the strolling of the heifers and we start out with the serious side which is the slow living summit and this year the focus of that is the future of women in food entrepreneurship um, and I invite everyone to look at um, the website uh, slowlivingsummit.org. Uh, you'll notice that we have wonderful um, presenters this year. Uh, Stacy Vanek Smith uh, from National Public Radio will be here, and she is going to advertise, and she is advertising this our wonderful little town of Brawlboro nationally, which is very exciting, and it will be recorded. Some of it will be recorded by her um, at the Latches Theater. Uh, so we're excited to let the, the world know about uh, uh, Brawlboro, Vermont, and all the wonderful things that we do in Brawlboro, Vermont. Um, and she's excited to come here as well. Um, so that's the serious side. And then uh, we start with uh, our wonderful Friday festivity. Um, as we talked before, we're going to have specialty food and um, sampling of um, alcohol uh, from various parts of Vermont at the River Garden. And the new twist uh, that we're trying in, in um, this year is to have our Friday festivities on the commons. And Anne, you, do you want to talk about sure. that? Sure. Yeah, so Friday night from 5 to 9, we'll have vendors, food trucks, craft vendors, home improvement, the full gamut of the vendors and exhibitors, um, some nonprofits, um, some local agencies, other businesses. And it's not just a, it's not a craft fair. There's a lot of uh, different exhibitors, so we like to stress that there's a lot of things for everybody. And um, Beth Kendall, who organizes our entertainment, has got a really great lineup of local bands um, that are a big draw for people. Um, so we are, it's during Gallery Walk, and what we're doing is we've hired the mover bus to pick up in front of Candle in the Night. We'll go up to the Common, drop people off. So if someone's had a drink and they want to go up to the Common, they can ride the mover, um, and it will bring them back downtown. Uh, they'll be looping all night long until 9 o'clock. So, uh, and the parking, people can park downtown wherever they usually park for downtown and then get up to the common and back, or certainly walk. So, you know, we hope it's, we, we count on it being perfect weather. Um, so that's... Can I ask a question about sure. that, Anne? Has that something that um, the retail shop owners on Main Street are looking forward to? Um, and have you worked with the downtown development business we, we haven't worked I you know finger quotes here um, worked with them on this we've had a lot been in discussions over the last few years about this event um, really We're I, testing it this part year. of the decision for doing this wasn't really ours uh, it's the fire department <laughs> it's the uh, the code that says a food truck that's got propane on it has to have 10 feet between the next and that's a new policy. That sort of rules out the downtown street fest. It makes it real hard to have food vendors in 10 feet between everyone. Um, that's the 10 feet that we would put a craft table in. So 
um, with that? Well, because I, I'm just, I think that's good news because I think it will both be your event and mm -hmm. also help the retail establishments. Oh, there's a lot of great, thanks, Liz. The there's time. a lot of great benefits to it. I think, yeah, yeah the retail establishment won't be blocked. There will be still downtown activity. Um, I think it's a positive thing. Also, from the standpoint of our vendors, they can come. There's they can come set up Friday night and stay till Saturday. It's a little more meaningful. We can attract a certain type of vendor for that. Um, but with that said, Anne, um, as we discussed as a team, um, and discussed um, with Peter and other people, um, we're testing it this year, uh, and this is a community event. And uh, we're always looking for more volunteers to come and be part of our team. Anyone is welcome. And um, if this doesn't work out and pleasing to everyone, we're certainly happy to talk with you as well as our committee. And everyone is welcome to come and be in our committee. Um, and we can think of different things. But it's a huge celebration for the uh, community. Oh, I, I think it's an improvement. I think it's a win-win for the retail and for your organization. So Saturday we have the capstone and the big celebration uh, of the farmers. And I have to tell you, this is our 18th year. And um, I usually come out um, in the very beginning of the parade with many, many farmers. And to come out and see this town welcome and greet our farmers and the parade is the most heartwarming thing. Um, there are farmers who literally have tears in their eyes uh, because they're so appreciative of people saluting them. Uh, we've had uh, very few, and I don't want to use the R word, but people come out even in the rain because farmers have to work in the rain. And uh, we always salute our <laughs> what farmers. Our, what? Went through a quick Rolodex to figure out what the. <laughs> <are>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's very exciting to have our community celebrate um, and salute our farming community. Um, and they are really the anchor of our community. Um, and we have to remember that. That's why we all live here. So we're very the happy theme, in that. The theme this oh, year. Oh, and the yeah. theme this oh. year. It's very exciting. Uh, farmers are our heroes, and we welcome everyone to come and dressed as a superhero. Uh, I'm going to try to create a black and white cape, um, and I think the children and the parents will uh, really enjoy that. And the parade, uh, people are already thinking and have planned some wonderful, I'm hearing wonderful surprises for the parade um, with that theme. So um, if other folks who are listening have any ideas for that, we welcome that and we'd like to share with other people. So um, please call us. So the parade is a wonderful, wonderful capstone. Uh, people come from very far to see that and celebrate with Browboro and celebrate our farmers. Can you talk a little bit about the dedication that Strolling of the Heifers and all of our farmers that participate have to the health and emotional well-being and physical well-being of any of the animals that Absolutely. come? Because I know that's deep and I just want to clarify Absolutely. That. So this is our 18th year. And uh, Stephen Major, um, who's the veterinarian from uh, Green Man Bovine Equine, um, he's the lead veterinarian. We also have um, uh, volunteer veterinarians. Uh, but Steve also knows the animals who come to the parade because he's a veterinarian of large animals. Um, but he checks every animal um, that comes. Uh, the participants have to bring the animal's paper, all their health records with them that he reviews, um, and he checks them out. And um, if he, in his assessment as a veterinarian, um, they do not qualify, uh, then they don't participate. Um, so veterinarians are also marching in uh, the parade. Um, but I will tell you on Flat Street, I'd like to go back to that, where the staging mm -hmm. is. 
Uh, we have lots of uh, troughs uh, filled with water, uh, with food. Uh, you see how much uh, the farmers and the children love the animals. They brush them, they rub them, uh, they hug them. Um, and, um, you know, they're beloved. Um, when the parade and um, the animals are marching, um, Steve Major in his veterinary ambulance, um, also there's a cattle um, special uh, truck uh, that follows them. If he assesses that an animal is uh, unable to participate, uh, they will stop and um, lovingly put the animal in the ambulance. Um, so, and then when the animals are finished, we also have a big water trough for them. Now you have to remember, it's not a very big route um, from start to finish, uh, and that's waiting, it's 45 minutes. I don't even know how far Flat Street to um, the Common is. It's, it's about a half a mile. It's probably a, something like a half a mile, so it's not such a big route. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's so wonderful to see the 4-H club members who've worked with the animal for three months beforehand, and we visit the farms, and it's just wonderful to watch, um, uh, working with them on uh, walking and being on a halter and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of time put into it. It's not just something that's thrown together, and it's extremely well thought out. Thank you so much. Um, and then we're not done. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Oh my God. Um, did you have any other questions in regards to that? I don't. That that definitely answered okay. it for me. So um, after the and this year it's a little different. So the parade is uh, going to go up Linden Street, uh -huh. and then turn uh, where the common is and end by Route Five. Oh. Um, and um, uh, we are using the commons this year. Um, we're using the courthouse parking lot. We are using the law firm parking lot. Uh, we are using the, um, um, the uh, American, Legion. Uh, American Legion, thank you. And uh, the health building, uh, we parking. have uh, the parking lot of that. Uh, and that's on Saturday. And I think it will work out really nicely because it's a little different mm -hmm. and we have to rethink uh, of different activities for those things. Uh, there are a lot, as we all know, there's a lot of elderly people in this community and it's hard for them to walk down to, mm -hmm. down to the retreat grounds. So we're really excited about change and change is always good because it makes you think of new things. Great, I look forward to seeing the new layout. And then, wait. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> On Sunday, we have our tour to Heifer, and it's going to start this year, another change. Um, it's going to start at the Rob Family Farm, mm. um, and we have a 15-mile ride, uh, we have a 30-mile ride, and a 60-mile ride, and we're really excited about that. And the marina will continue doing the farmer's breakfast, um, and those who are not athletically inclined, uh, we have our farm tours, mm -hmm. and they are wonderful. Um, so you can go to our website, www.strolling the heifers, and sign up for the farm tours or the Slow Living Summit or uh, the Tour to Heifer. And I love those pieces because it brings you back to the farms. Mm -hmm. um, and the farmers are very excited to welcome everyone. Um, and the farm tours fill up very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend people signing up as soon as possible. And it's our 18th year, could you believe it? Thank you. I just wanted to add something, mm -hmm. um, Orly, you covered, it. the change is great. So um, the piece about the parade going a different route, I mm -hmm. think this is a great forum, whoever's watching, to just um, keep in mind, pick your seat out now yeah. on the municipals. <laughs> <Thinking about that. laughs> it's only a few weeks away. Um, so it will be coming up a different route. There's still going to be plenty of visibility between Wells Fountain area and the municipal hill. So it will be coming up this way mm -hmm. and then turning and then the, the streets will be closed until everybody's cleared and then they'll reopen with the traffic going. Um, we. 
have really beefed up our parking um, shuttles. Mm. And we really want to encourage people to park either at the old Home Depot lot, at the high school, or out at Academy School. And I'm working with securing all that now. Um, and we will have consistent shuttles going all day long from 8 a.m. Free rides from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. Um, because uh, we're not at the retreat, we are taking a lot of downtown parking spaces for the vendors. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not taking all of them, <laughs> but uh, a lot of the bank parking lots and St. Michael's School and some other spots, Linden Gardens, around like that, for vendors to be able to park their cars uh, because they have to unload and be set up and all. But there is plenty of parking in the area. Rest assured, there will be shuttles to and from. And, and people uh, who use the shuttle servers really love it. Yeah. Because the buses are, it's a 15-minute loop, and, uh, you know, you, you're not in town, so um, you can then, when you're done, um, be able to leave uh, for your home real quickly. And those stops will be at the common. There will always be the buses circling, and they'll be well marked and all of that. Uh, I'd just like to mention yeah. how sustainable having those buses is. Well... <laughs> It's, it's fabulous because um, there's that much less traffic downtown trying to park. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Um, carpooling, too, is always good. We encourage, uh, we only allow one parking spot per vendor. It's like you have two cars, you got to find your own parking somewhere else. And really, we, we really encourage them. The other piece the that's, that's huge this year uh, is we work very closely with Wyndham Solid Waste. And mm. we really stress this is shooting to be a zero waste event. Um, there will not be trash cans where you can throw whatever you want in there. There will be stations where you're going to have to decide. Mm, we have people called waste watchers who will stand there <laughs> and help you figure out what, what piece of trash goes where um, from uh, recycling to compost to waste. And last year we hit, we were a model group, we hit 65% diversion. And this year our goal is 75% yep. to 100. Um, we're working with a company in Keene that does, uh, I think it's Elm City compost. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be taking and handling all the composting and we have a whole team of volunteers that work and some paid people as well. Um, so it's a big team effort and I think I want to encourage people to be aware of where you toss things. So, And we will be educating around that piece as well. David? The um, uh, Two questions. The compost won't be going to the waste district compost site? They have some contracted, subcontracted with this company in Keene. Yes. Oh, so we're working with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Elm City. And the other question, do you, have you coordinated with Rich Earth Institute for urinals and horrifies? Oh, yes. We have plenty of those. Great. I mean, you can you never have enough, Sorry. especially from 12 Sorry. to 1. <laughs> no, they're, yeah, they are planning on being in the parade this year, too, I think. Great. I've talked Great. to them about that. I have so. I noticed on the forms that um, Public Works hasn't chimed in. Uh, on, on any of these permit forms? They have since chimed in. They have since yeah. chimed in. Chime. Yes, but you can't <laughs> chime. It's a little bit later, and sometimes what happens if we get busy, uh, Jan will email them to me, and we've approved all these Great. events. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I would like to thank um, the town uh, personally. Um, you know, we worked together for 18 years on this. And the most important piece is uh, safety. And, uh, you know, just the teamwork around that um, has been just amazing. And I just want to thank all the departments uh, for, for uh, working together and uh, providing us with an amazing uh, celebration for this community. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to open it up to public comment. David? Hi there, uh, David Heiler, Weston Station. Um, I first, congratulations on 18 years. Um, yeah, you know, watched this parade and this whole weekend develop over the years, and uh, it's become an impressive. It's always been an impressive endeavor, but it seems to get better every year. And um, and I want to say that this year is exciting, especially uh, for a couple reasons. I think you've addressed a couple concerns that I've had over the years. One being that uh, the event tends to bring in literally thousands of people that would come in. Um, and like a circus, I know Tony left, but uh, you know, like a circus in many instances, it, you know, the circus comes to town, everyone comes to the event, 
and they go hang out on the circus grounds and then they all go home. And I think what's happening this year, um, because it's closer to town, is it really is going to bring a lot more of these people to uh, experience our mm -hmm. local stores and vendors and restaurants. And, um, and it's really literally in the middle of our town, which I think is fantastic. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, that's a huge uh, new aspect. But I also think that this year you seem to be incorporating a lot more local vendors, and I think that's also um, really exciting uh, as a local business owner and a vendor. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, and I just want to make a comment about this parade in general, and I think, um, you know, what it does in this day and age of uh, all the strife and everything we've talked about, a lot of this meeting's been about, you know, what's going on in this world right now, it, it makes all these people have a great time. You know, I can't speak for the cows, um, but I feel like even the cows get, get love. Um, it celebrates so many of the great things that happen in our town, you know, whether it's NECA or New England Youth Theater or our high schools, uh, our, you know, our educational, our sports teams, and, um, and everyone has, just has a great time. Um, and especially celebrating our farmers, I think, in this state is, is huge. So thank you. Thank you, David. David. Thanks, David. Further public participation? Ricky? Hello. Does the strolling of the heifers parade endorse treating animals as entertainment? And and Orly, you are interrogated if you choose to be by a member of the public. So. Okay. Do I respond to you or? You can respond oh. directly to Ricky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you repeat your question? I Does the strolling of the heifers parade endorse treating animals as entertainment? Uh, depends on how you define entertainment. Uh, we're celebrating uh, animals in the parade just as we celebrate people. I did not attend the last parade. I was boycotting in protest of using animals or abusing animals as entertainment because also like, I saw the photos afterwards and I just thought it was very unethical in the photos uh, that there were people were pushing the animals forward and like pulling them too and the the animals did not seem uh, comfortable being surrounded um, in an urban environment outside of the farm and that was unnatural to them do you have any comment to that I would love to share with you many more photos there may be one or two I think that you're referring to there are hundreds of photos of people cuddling and curled up and happy with the cows afterwards they're 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 quite content and they're having a good time occasionally there might be a cow that's like i gotta stop and do my business who knows what the reason is but as orly explained before we do have people on hand if there is any distress it is handled in a very um respectful and and uh, safe way safe way for the animals and if, i just wanted to speak about the entertainment issue this is not about putting animals on display for entertainment. I mean, we are not making tigers jump through hoops. We are celebrating farms and farmers and cows. It's not entertainment in that, that sense, by my definition. Just because um, an animal may um, not resist uh, being touched, I don't think animals can really consent to touch and just forcing them to be surrounded by a lot of people, strangers touching them is unethical. Well, no comment for me. Uh, we can agree to disagree, respectfully disagree. Um, I'm, I'm around many farm animals, and they love to be touched, and uh, from my experience, and really enjoy people. These animals are very socialized and are used to people and used to being in situations like that. So um, they're really happy. Thank you, Ricky. Is there somebody else who hasn't spoken in the audience that would like to speak? Okay, great. You feel like you've said all you need to say for this evening, and we'll move on to our Thank motions. You. Thank you. We have volunteers, if you're interested in volunteering oh, yes. with us, there is a place online to sign up. We awesome. need uh, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. I have some slots if you're an early <laughs> riser. <laughs> no. Or you can come for two hours. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it looks like we have three separate motions here okay, for each permit. All right, David, take it away. Uh, I move that we approve 
an open air permit for the strolling of the heifers Friday evening festival on the Brattleboro Common, in the parking lot at the American Legion, and in the parking lot of the Wyndham County Courthouse on June 7, 2019, between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. Thank you. All right. David has made the motion for an open air permit for strolling of the heifers for the Friday evening festival, which will take place up on the common 5 to 9 on June 7. Um, all those in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we've got motion number two. Who wants to take that one? I'll take it. All right, Liz. I make a motion to approve a parade, open air meeting, and street sidewalk blocking permit for the strolling of the heifers parade on Main Street and the expo to be held on the Brattleboro Common and at 45 Linden Street on June 8th, 2019, between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Great. Liz has made the motion to approve a parade, open air meeting, and street sidewalk blocking permit for strolling of the heifers for the parade on Main Street and the expo to be held on the Common and at 45 Linden Street, June 8th, between 8 and 4. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Last motion, who wants it? Oh, it's an easy one, I'll do this one. Uh, I move to approve a parade, an open air meeting permit for the Tour de Heifer bike ride event on June 9th, 2019, between 7.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. Great, Daniel has approved, moved to approve a parade <coughs> slash open air meeting permit for the Tour de Heifer bike ride event held on June 9th, 2019, between 7.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Orly and Ann. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks, guys. All right, at this time we move on to our financial report, our monthly financial report for the month of March, John, given by John O'Connor, our finance director. Thank you, Brandy. You're welcome, John. Good evening, everyone. Um, in your packet is the March financial report, and as of the end of March, we're 75% of the way through the fiscal year, and general fund expenditures stood at 74.7, so pretty much right on target, and included in that figure are several annual payments that we make for insurance, human services, lease, and um, note payments. And if we prorate those, it gets the uh, percentage down to 71.7%. So we're doing well with the general fund so far this year. Um, utilities fund expenditures were at 70.8%. Parking fund expenditures are at 80.9%. And again, there's some annual expenditures in the um, utilities fund that if those are prorated, would get the utility fund down to 68.9%. Uh, of their annual expenditures. And the situation in the parking fund uh, being over budget is primarily due to um, the meters that were replaced. Oh. And the old meters were not fully depreciated. So when they were retired, we had to write off the balance and that's what hit in the month of March and yep. put us over budget. That's a one-time hit to the budget and so depreciation in the future should drop back to where it had been prior to that retirement. Um, solid waste disposal, uh, the revenues were at 70.2%, expenditures at 68.9%, and um, the uh, refuse bag revenues, curbside collection costs, and tipping fees all lag a month. So the March Revenue for refuse bags, curbside collection expense, and tipping fees will not be recorded until April. So we're one month behind for a good number of the expenses in the solid waste fund and revenues as well. Great. The loan fund shows that we have $4,193,147 in outstanding loans issued through various loan programs. Uh, three loans had payments that were overdue, and two loans are in default and fully reserved. Program income report indicates that the town has 649,267 in available funds for additional grants and loans as of the end of March. 
And then finally, there's a report on grants um, that has various information on those grants. And there are 44 active grants that are currently being managed and five grants that are currently in the application process. So that's my report for the month of March, the financial report for the month of March. If you have any specific questions on any of the line items in the budget, I'll try to answer those for you. And if not, that's what I have for you tonight for that. Thank you, John. Members of the board have questions on the budget? <coughs> budget stuff? I have like a newbie question, and you know, I feel silly for asking it, but you know what? It's good to ask questions because then you find out what you need to know. So on page four of five in the utilities fund. Utilities <coughs> fund. Okay, there's a, yep. you got, there's a line item in the administration section that says other operating expenses. It was budgeted for 5000 and it's $23,529. And so I'm just curious about what that might be, if we know. Okay, I hope we do. I, <laughs> I don't have that off the top of my head. I don't know. Steve, do you have any idea what that might be? I don't have the number. Okay. I will get that. I will get back to you with that, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stress that now. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Throw on a curveball right yeah, off the sorry. bat. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Good question. Anybody else on the board have questions or comments for yeah. John? Uh, I have a question. It might be a fire department question. Um, there's something called banner associated with the fire department. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Income. that is. Okay. You want to come up, Mike? So are you looking at the banner income? Yes. That's when the banner's over Main Street. The oh. fire department hangs those on Sunday mornings and we charge the permit holder um, a certain amount of money and that's what goes in that line item. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Further questions from the board? Okay. Questions from the public on John's March monthly financial report. Okay. That was fast. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No action is required on this item, but we appreciate your work. Thank you. Things look good. Okay. The next item we are going to move to is financial management questionnaire and internal controls checklist. Mm. <laughs> Take it away, Peter. <laughs> so these are annual requirements. John will describe their um, things that we do in conjunction with the auditors um, that uh, document for your satisfaction and the public um, the degree to which our financial controls are sufficient. Yeah, the, there are two different um, questionnaires here. The first one is um, required by the state. And we get this uh, form from the state auditor and we are required to um, complete this uh, questionnaire annually and um, bring it before the select board and have someone on the select board review it and sign off on it. So all of you should look at it, and if you have questions on that, I can try to answer those. And um, this one's pretty straightforward. And in almost all cases, we, you know, we don't have any internal control fallibilities we're, we've got good internal controls so um, you know the checklist just basically bears that out and it's also unchanged from last year for those of right. you who saw it last year uh -huh. right David uh, this is actually not internal control or external control the last uh, mm -hmm. the last the second to last page and the last page um, at the bottom number six electronic banking transfers done exclusively from an off network computer and, and that's a no which means it's done from a network computer yep and the other ones are computers used by finance personnel accessible remotely and that's a yes and i just wonder what secure i know we have a new system and i know we have firewalls and are you confident that running these things on network computers that are accessible remotely is what are the safety safeguards we have never had an issue with uh, transferring funds using these computers, right. never. And no problem being hacked or ransomed or anything like that? No. So we think we have adequate firewalls and protection on the right. network to right. prohibit that. I imagine you use VPN for that. Uh, yes. So those are encrypted tunnels, so they can yeah. 
Well, I just, I just um, discovered Battlestar Galactica for the first time. Oh, God. <laughs> and, um, they never networked their computers, that. and that's why they lived. So. Right. <laughs> it's, only, it's only 25 years old. Right. If you were to ask me a phrase, it was a... not going to come up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's left with finger, you just won. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I highly recommend it. It holds up really well. Are there further questions or comments from the board? On, or, John, were you TV. done? Yeah. Okay. Are there further, further comments or questions around. on the internal checklist? <clears throat> Ricky? Sorry. Oh, that was great. Oh. Don't apologize. Is the questionnaire that's asked, is it? only answered by the select board in a executive private session or is that an open to the public session it's, it's in this public session and the documents have been on the town's website since friday and we'd be happy to provide copies to you tomorrow if you want to thank you take a look at the checklist they're, they're, or we have them right now yeah. Yeah. oh they're nope. right there. chris has them all it's a big nice stack. <laughs> and we are on new in the section of new business item C. Okay, so it looks like we are looking for a motion. Who wants to take that one? To oh, I'll do it. Sorry, right. I was I was one above. Uh, I, author I move that we authorize the chair to sign the financial management questionnaire for towns and cities, the municipal checklist for internal controls, part one, cash controls, and municipal checklist for internal control, part two, other controls relating to cash or risk. Excellent. David has made a motion <laughs> to authorize the chair, which is me to sign the financial management questionnaire for towns and cities, the municipal checklist for internal controls, part one, cash controls, and the municipal checklist for internal control, part two, other controls relating to cash or risk. This is giving me flashbacks to being in banking. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Okay. This time we're going to move on to item D under new business, which is the EPA state town brownfield contracting item regarding Good Long chance. Falls paper. Um, this comes from the planning department, and Peter is going to speak to that, I believe. Yes, thank you. So um, this is an item that normally would have been handled administratively, but it's before you this evening because of one unusual aspect um, related to the Long Falls paper board um, project. So. Um, you'll recall that this is what used to be Nina paper and it was going to close on December 31st and then there was a um, very aggressive effort to uh, help um, Long Falls Paper Board take over that plant. They're reinvesting in the plant, they saved the jobs, they're actually adding jobs at the location. It's been a really successful um, collaboration and is ongoing. Um, there's state involvement, um, the lion's share of the local work has been done by BDCC and um, Town, the town has been playing a support role. One of the support roles that we're playing there is um, in this brownfields element of it. There's some cleanup work that needs to be done at the plant and, and on the grounds there. And that needs to be completed before the project will be eligible for um, CDBG funding that we believe will be forthcoming. So it's important that this be done and that it be done promptly. The unusual thing here is because of the state's involvement with this and the likely additional state funds that will be provided to the project, the state wanted to use their environmental consultant rather than the town's environmental consultant um, for this brownfields work. And um, we want to accommodate that, but we don't have a contractual relationship with the state's consultant. And so the matter that's before you tonight, I'm, I'm actually authorized when we do a piece of work like this using one of the three pre-approved consultants that we have on retainer for this, or not, not a cost retainer, but available to us to um, bid among those three pre-approved firms each time we have a piece of work like this. Um, by a prior action of the select board, I'm authorized to approve those and move them forward. What I don't have the authority to do is, um, independent of your action, um, have the town piggyback on the state's contract with its contractor 
to do this piece of work. And so what's before you tonight is we're asking that you allow us to move forward in the manner that we normally do with the one exception that this will be the state's pre-approved contractor rather than one of the three town approved contractors. Um, in the planning board, we've often reviewed um, similar contracts under this EPA funding, and in designating the um, the town's consultants, we've also reviewed Stone Environmental's work, and we think they're highly qualified. That's good feedback. Thanks, Liz. I'm just curious. Uh, something just occurred to me. Does this add to our list of now four, or does this just a one-off? It's a one-off. One so what what we're doing here, um, by the action you'll take in a moment, I hope, um, you'll be authorizing that we execute a contract with the state's contractor for this particular piece of work. We'll still be operating as we continue on with our brownfields work locally um, with uh, the three pre-approved for the town. I, I just also want to mention, sorry David, that this is a really nice collaboration between the town and the um, state and Wyndham Regional. Yep. Who, who pays for the cleanup? No, that's, so if then it's, it's, they talked about complexities and potential contamination. Right, and because of the, the complex network of support Agencies in this I'm I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure whether Patrick does off the top of his head I don't fully know the answer to that question either, but I I, nice. I Don't I don't know the answer. Yeah. I, I can take there. a stab same. at it um, The the town's EPA brownfield funds are just to study and not mm -hmm. to clean up right. and I would am, and I know the Wyndham Regional Commission organization is the same uh, so I know that neither one of those entities will actually pay for the cleanup. But I also know that the cleanup uh, process and costs have not been delineated yet because you have to do the assessment first. Right, right. So we're not there yet, and uh, I, I'm also unsure as to who finally will pay for the cleanup. Yeah. It, it's very likely, though, because of the way in which this came together where um, <laughs> Long Falls Paper Board stepped in to preserve the jobs and rehab the plant, it's very likely that one of the support agencies, not the town, because we would know if we had made that commitment, mm -hmm. but one of the others who are providing support to the project is likely going to handle that phase of this. But we'll find out um, better information and, and send an uh, okay. update to each of you. All right, thank you. I suspect it's BDCC. Yeah. But I do too, but I I'm don't know. Not a hundred percent sure about. We try that. hard not to. They guess are the property the owners. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, further questions or comments from the board? Nope. Questions or comments from the public? Ricky. In situations where the state is offering contractors, can the town still uh, offer a? Uh, a similar contractor just to so that the state and the town can uh, cooperate and compare uh, their their methods and approaches to resolving these kinds of issues there are times when that might be appropriate in this particular instance the state was very clear that um, they were supportive of this effort and wished for us to use their contractor. They didn't, explicitly didn't want the town, not because they have any, <clears throat> excuse me, concerns about the um, quality of the work of our three firms, but because they weren't selected through a state procurement process. The state thought it was very important that this piece of work be done by the state's uh, contractor, and we were happy to go through this extra step of bringing it to you so that we could piggyback on their contract. Would their contractor cooperate with a municipal contractor? They would if they needed to. In this case, they're going. To, they're, the state's contractor is going to do the piece of work. They won't need to co coordinate with the town's contractors. Our town's contractors won't be involved in this particular piece of work. They do a lot of similar work in our community around other projects. May I add something? Um, the state, in designating this contractor, went through an RFP process to designate them. So there was a competitive bid, and they, their work was compared. I just 
appreciate any time when the municipality can keep the state in check as well by using our own contractors with their contractors. Fair enough, Brady. I know that. Absolutely. Further questions or comments from the public? Okay. Hearing none, um, I'll let somebody make a motion. I'll make a motion. <coughs> Excuse me. To authorize the town manager to execute a contract with Stone Environmental of Montpelier, Vermont, for a phase two environmental assessment at Long Falls Paper Board. All right, thank you. Tim has made a motion to authorize the town manager to execute a contract with Stone Environmental of Montpelier, Vermont, for a phase two environmental assessment at Long Falls Paper Board. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Five zero. Next up, we have the skate park, and we have with us. Let's see. Yeah, come on up to the table. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff Clark. Carol. Jeff. I was like, is there anybody else hiding back there? Okay. Okay, I wasn't sure. That's all. This could be. I didn't see any left. like push <laughs> out of the chair. Okay. All right. So. Update us. Here we are uh, updating you on uh, the, the progress the committee has had over the last few months. A um, few months back we told you that we anticipated that the bids would come in high, but we, get, we didn't know for sure till we put the project out to bid. And so we put the project out to bid and um, we received three bids on March 27th, um, ranging from 284000 Eight hundred ninety-five dollars to three hundred and seventy-nine thousand. Mm. So a yep. little bit higher than expected. Um, when you combine it all together um, and add in what is left that we have to pay out to the, the designer Stantec, that kind of left us a hole of approximately ninety-six thousand dollars. Ninety-six four hundred twenty-seven. So. We have been scurrying around, and I'm very excited. I'm pulling the table to tell you the news. What is the news? Um, about an hour before our meeting tonight, we found out that uh, the uh, Vermont Community Foundation Withington Fund has come through with $75,000. Oh, my God. Woohoo! So, to pull that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Pulls that hole from ninety six down to uh, over twenty one thousand dollars. So, Oof. still not quite enough to get the job done. Um, so, what uh, I would be recommending to you this evening, um, after looking at the bids, um, that uh, we reject the bids, mm -hmm. and um, that I would go back and work with the contractor to rescope the project. Um, and work with fellow department on the par um, Department of Public Works mm -hmm. to see if we, there's a couple of projects that we can pull out, like the walkway, like the parking, where the town could do that work um, in the landscaping and maybe mm -hmm. some miscellaneous items. And when we once we rescope that, put it back out, um, hopefully that project's going to come in to where we can put the shovel in the ground. You guys are really have worked through a lot of adversity on this project and I appreciate you not being daunted by this and I really appreciate the $75,000 coming in. That's yes, the Withington fantastic. Fund and the Ruth and Nelson Withington Fund that's managed by the Vermont Community Foundation is who we really need to be um, giving kudos to this evening. They, you know, they're they've been very supportive in this project prior to, they've already given yeah. um, uh, two other times to this project. Um, so. Um, there's over $100,000 that has come in from the Withington Fund to support this this project. So I think that's uh, a very valuable information that should be put out to the public and how supportive that uh, that fund has been um, to, to Brattleboro. And the, rec there's, the department has um, had a lot of benefits from that fund um, over the years. And this is just one way um, that this, you know, that the community will really benefit. Well, that big thanks to the Withington Fund for all the support they've given over time and for the, it's always exciting to get news right before a meeting, so for the well-timed the well -timed yeah. news of support for tonight, which yeah. makes for great TV. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Great TV, good headline yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Get on it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> There's no hint there, Chris. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, I have a question. Just yeah, please. Some sort of strategy question. You have two bids that seem pretty close to each other. Is it is it handy if you are you going to let all three know, or are you going to encourage them to all consider town, you know, how to cut down the project so that it could fall within our our budget? We would let um, all three know that we are are going to re, you know based on your decision this evening, mm -hmm. right. um, then we would let all three of them know, and then we'd uh, invite them all three to re. Um, bid on the project. Okay. And is it open? Uh, do the Canadians know how much higher they are? Yeah. They do know. Yeah. The can, I, can I speak to that? Yes, <laughs> so it's, um, yes, all the information is public, and the because the bidding process needs to be sealed bids um, for to ensure proper competition, um, there won't be any negotiation with any of these three. What will happen is the bids will be rejected. They'll all be advised that it didn't work out this time. There'll be the rescoping process that Carol described, and then a new set of specifications will be put out on the street for a new sealed bid process. And at that time, we'll get what we get, which you know may well include the two lower bidders on this. Um, I'd be surprised if the higher bidder chooses to bid again, but they'd be welcome to, and anybody else who's qualified would be welcome to. Great, thank you for that clarification. And if I could also clarify, um, new line, uh, they're, they're offices in Canada, but they actually have people that work out of the U.S. That's fantastic. David. Carol, how long do you think the scoping and rebidding will take? I think, you know, we can probably get it back out to bid within, um, within the month. Within a month, we should be able Great. to get it back out to bid. Great. That's amazing. Um, because we've we kind of talked about this, um, and, and they've been working on it since... March 27th, because the writing was on the wall at that point that this did not fit within our budget. So at that time, I, I asked them to start start working on it. Yeah. And is there, is it, would it be possible to get it done this summer? <laughs> um, I think it's more likely to say that the project would be complete by snowfall. You know, because here we are in April and getting on the, the work plan, getting it, put it back out to bid. Um, my hopes at this point is that the project would be complete by snowfall. If it's earlier they, than that, I'd be happy, just like I am tonight with the, yeah. with the news, but... Um, Do they come with special shovels for scooping up the rounded okay. areas? And yes. <laughs> the snow out of it? Can yeah, we they do come on those wheels. pictures with the shovels and the hats? This is, we're moving on to the other side. Does anybody on this side of the table have any questions or comments? <laughs> I've never gotten to do the table. And I've been very to you. Well... I know firsthand how hard the committee and Carol work, and I congratulate them again. Yeah. Nice job, Carol. Thank you. Thanks. Jeff, you didn't get to say anything. That's why I've got excited. the next point. <laughs> oh, good. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, sorry. we can move on to Jeff. Okay. okay. Um, well, first off, um, I want to publicly say thank you, Liz, for your years of service on the Skate Bar Committee, the um, experience you bring, and the enthusiasm. You will be missed. Um, so, uh, Per a memo sent to Peter April 3rd, uh, the basic, uh, the Skate Park Committee would like to uh, reduce the uh, members of our committee from 7 to 5 because Liz is now on the select board and also um, an inactive uh, participant from our committee. A solid year. Uh, we've reached out and still no uh, responses. So we'd like to reduce from 7 to 5 if uh, you can make that possible. Great. Thank you for that. That makes sense. Um, questions from the public on either the project itself, the cost, or the idea of reducing membership from seven to five. Frogs. Like Franz Reichman from the Finance Committee. Uh, so if you rework the proposal and some certain things like a sidewalk or other things are removed, uh, did I hear right that then those things would be done by the Department of Public Works as your idea? Um, some of it would be done by the Department of Public Works. Some would be do, um, done by um, the Recreation Park staff working in conjunction with Public Works. And would that then be included in the Public Works budget? Or I mean, how, how would that work done by Public Works be paid for? 
the uh, material costs would come out of the uh, project costs. The material costs? The material costs. And the labor? Um, I'll defer that to the town the manager. The labor will be charged to the operating accounts where the labor gets charged to when they're doing other work that benefits the town. So we, we do this occasionally in circumstances like this. We've actually, on a number of utility projects, um, the Public Works Department staff will perform some of the work and contract for other parts of the work where either you know, a specialized piece of equipment is required or some special expertise may be required. Maybe there's particular risk to a certain element, but where we do components of it so that we can um, reduce the cost of the project by providing some of the, the labor required. So uh, effectively that, uh, that contribution will come out of the general fund? Out of the operating budget, the general fund, that's correct. And do we have an estimate of how much money that might be? We don't yet because that rescoping is going to be going on. What we know is um, there had been a concern here that was on the magnitude of $96,000 where reducing the scope of the project, reducing what was going to get built would have had to be in play in addition to looking at the possibility of providing some um, town labor in order to help get it to completion. Now, with the Withington Fund news, it appears that we can build the park as it has been envisioned, but we need to do some work together to figure out how to most effect, you know, cost effectively do that. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Further public comment or question? Okay. <coughs> then I would entertain two motions. I'll make them. Okay. Them both. <laughs> it. Um, I move to reject all bids for the skate park construction project. Sounds horrible. And I move to reduce the membership of the Brattleboro Area Skate Park is coming, basic, from seven to five members. Okay. Liz has made two motions. One to reject all bids for the skate park construction project and a motion to reduce the membership of the basic membership from seven to five. Do we need to take those up separately? You can vote on them together. We can vote on them together, okay. All, all those in favor of the two motions? All right. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motions carry. Okay, right. thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for the good news. Yeah. Okay, now we move on to item F under new business, which is the annual readoption of the local emergency operations plan. And we have Mike, Chief Mike Bukasi, sorry, I tangled my tongue there for a moment, who's going to come up and join us. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> so, good evening. Um, I'm Mike Bukasi, Fire Chief. And each uh, year under Vermont state law, all municipalities have to submit a local emergency operations plan to the state. Um, along the way, Vermont Emergency Management um, gets uh, to review this, and if any of the municipalities don't submit a plan, um, a lot of the Homeland Security and Emergency Management grants hinge on whether you've submitted a plan or not. Um, so each year, um, we look at the plan, um, update it, and each year I try to add uh, a little bit more to it. This year has been a little bit different. Um, they've changed what they've always called an operations plan to an emergency management plan. Um, it's quite lengthier. Um, that's work, my dear. Um, it, it holds a, a lot more information in it, and uh, basically, uh, emergency operations center operations, um, information gathering. What it amounts to, it turns into a resource guide, a checklist uh, for the emergency operations center staff, um, as well as there's. Uh, uh, a lot of resource material that's included that doesn't go into the plan, but it's kept at the different departments, our, our response plan to school emergencies, the Pleasant Valley Dam flood control plan, things like that that are uh, just resource material. Um, 
some of that is included in your packet tonight. Um, and I'm here just to ask that you adopt the, 29, or the uh, 2019 plan and uh, authorize uh, the town manager to sign it so we can submit it to the state. Great. Thank you for that. <coughs> Board questions or comments? I move we adopt the 2019 Brattleboro Emergency Operations Plan and to authorize the town manager to certify that the plan has been duly adopted by the board. Could there be any public yeah. comment yeah. I can take that after the motion. Yeah. You'll be I'll call in. Okay. Motion is on the table to authorize the town manager to execute a contract. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Where was I going? Mm -hmm. Motion is on the table to adopt the 2019 Brattleboro Emergency Operations Plan and to authorize the town manager to certify that the plan has been duly adopted by the board. And at this time, I will take public comment. Ricky? Is there any relation of this to the national management plan because I had read a reformer article from several years ago that had said that Brattleboro had um, agreed to comply with a, a federal law to arrest people uh, without any, um, and, and jail people without any right to going to court. Is this related to that and is that um, federal uh, compliance still in action i i don't know what you're speaking about regarding jailing yes. folks but it has yes. absolutely no relation whatever that is it has absolutely no relation to this plan or this action this evening okay thank you for clarifying and so you are not aware of any compliance with that okay i need to do more homework then to see if that was an accurate um article in the reformer any other Members of the public have any questions? Ivan? This is your first time. Um, is this published available to the public to read? Mm -hmm. I'm not questioning whether it's going to be approved tonight. Just e like once e it's approved. Is it sure. So when it's um, all packaged, each department, emergency services department, as well as the town manager's <coughs> office, will have a copy. Um, it's not published per se, but you're welcome to, to look at it. Oh, so it would be hard copy, but not sure. yeah. available on the internet. Yeah. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Further public comment or question? Okay, the motion is already on the table to adopt the 2019 Brattleboro Emergency Operations Plan and authorize the town manager to certify that the plan has been duly adopted by the board. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, we move on to G under new business, which is the Vermont Agency of Transportation, VTRANS, and it's the Department of Public Works approval of the annual financial plan. And already at the table, we have Steve Barrett. So, what you have before you is the, uh, the State of Vermont Agency of Transportation annual financial plan. Uh, for town highways, the annual form is required to be submitted 60 days after formally adopting the municipal budget at town meeting, which has been done. The financial plan is used to determine the amount of funding the town receives from the state, and which is dispersed quarterly. The annual approach appropriation is used to con for construction and repair of town roadways. So I'm looking for your signature. The requirement is that we spend $300 per road lane mile um, and if you look at uh, the page uh, two of one the information's there but it's not really good and clear um, there's a list of class one two and three highways um, there's a number there that you can see under class one it says 6.42 that's actually the miles of class one road mm -hmm. class two is 13.8964 six four is a class three and what that does is that totals up to about 85 miles. And if you did the math and times 300, it, it, the town would have to spend $25,500. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look at the number that says town tax fund 19 VSA section 307, it's $1,951,145. That's the amount the town has to appropriate with, from taxes for the highway department. Ooh. So Thank you for explaining that. Okay. Sure. I, I realize that the form isn't that clear as far as the document overall. I think in the future, we'll probably add that information in the, in the memo. Great. Okay. And the, usually we receive the uh, about uh, 200, this, according to this formula here, it'd be about 226,000 mm -hmm. a year is that we receive for money that gets put back into roads and the town highway department. Anybody on the board have questions or comments for Steve? I mean, obviously everybody understands what a class one, class two, and class three road is. So we wouldn't need to ask that. But if you did, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <not really laughs> that. But if, if you were to but ask that question. Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure everybody at home understands. Think of a class three road as, as a, a side street. Uh -huh. um, like a Oak Grove Avenue or Clark Avenue or a Whipple Street or mm -hmm. a Green Street. And think of a class two road as a connector road, like a Hinesburg Road or Upper Dummerston Road that is actually a connector road from one town to another or from one state highway. And a class one road is the main highways that go through town. You have Route 5 and you have Route 9. And so a section of those are class one and the town maintains a portion of them. And then there's certain borders like Putney Road before the Veterans Bridge. Uh, the state takes over, even though it's still within the town limits. So that's your quick and down and dirty good, classification like on roads. And, and like Perfect, a Steve. little follow up on that. So like the fact that there are only 6.4 miles of class one roads, but we receive a chunk of money from the state for those is because they are sort of state we're yes, they and, come, and yeah. larger generally, um, mm -hmm. sometimes you know more complicated in terms yeah. of the um, traffic control devices on them and that sort of thing. So the legislature, they come up with a formula, and there's a formula for each class road, and then they give us a percentage on the class one. It's like 6% of this total pot of money is distributed to all the towns according to the amount of miles that they have mm -hmm. of class one, two, or three. And the proportions are a little bit different depending on the type of road. But in the end, it ends up to basically over two hundred thousand dollars for us. So now I have a question. Yeah. So I used to live on a Class Four road, and I thought the classes were married to whether they're paved or unpaved, to some extent. So, so we just we have Class Fours too. That's for, correct. So we just discussed Class One, Two, and Three. Okay. Class Four roads are not maintained, and they're usually a gravel road um, that isn't maintained by the town. We only are responsible for drainage and basic upkeep of the road, but we don't plow them in the winter, um, and they get very little care. They basically get graded about once a year. They're very so, muddy so, right now. So kind so, of an unimproved, unimproved road, and they don't really wrap those into these funding mechanisms. Okay. Because so there's, there's class threes that are unpaved as well as paved. That's correct. Okay, Absolutely. that was my, I yeah. thought the Maybe distinction Meadowbrook. between three and four was no. paved versus no. unpaved, and I was and there's, totally yeah. wrong. Yeah. Thank you. That was this has been good it's very educational any other questions or comments from the board questions or comments from the public on our percentage of money that we get for the state from the state for maintaining these roads okay then I would entertain a motion which is somewhere on here yeah um. I move to approve the annual financial plan town highways form for submittal to the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Okay, there's a motion on the floor to oh, let's see over here. adopt the 2019, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, to approve the annual financial plan town highways form for submittal to the Vermont Agency of Transportation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was good. All right. Next up, we have authorization for Brooks Memorial Library to apply for grants, and it would be the Crosby Gannett Fund and Dunham Mason Fund. And we have Star Latronica. 
joining hey, us. Ivy. Hello. Okay, what do you want to tell us? So uh, we are blessed with an amazing treasure trove of significant and unique documents. Um, and although we have a cursory inventory of those documents, what we really need is some help from an archivist, which is a specialized skill set that will help to categorize and catalog those documents that will make them accessible to people so that um, someone can see that they're interested in researching uh, an event that, that happened in Brattleboro or uh, something significant in Brattleboro's history uh, or in Vermont history, and they can see that we have documents that might support their research. And so, as I mentioned, that's a, a very specialized skill set. Um, no one on our staff currently has that. And what we would like to do is apply for these grants that would allow us to buy some time of an archivist at, to at least get us sorted out and ready to go. Um, and then once those I, um, documents have been identified and classified and categorized and also recommendations made for preservation and conservation of those documents um, then we can move forward with making them accessible beyond the boundaries of Brattleboro and visitors who might come here and access them physically and in person but also you know ultimately we would like to see them accessible to people anywhere in the world uh, via technology so basically we're asking to uh, contract with an archivist that get us good. started on that road sounds an exciting project and a good project yeah. Okay, are there questions or comments from the board on this archivist? No? Pretty clear. Great. Questions or comments from the public? All right. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I move that we authorize the submission of a grant application in the amount of $1,000 to the Crosby Gannett Fund and a grant application in the amount of $500 from the Dunham Mason Fund to organize, conserve, and improve access to local history materials. Okay, there is a motion to authorize the submission of a grant application in the amount of $1,000 to the Crosby Gannett Fund and a grant application in the amount of $500 from the Dunham Mason Fund to organize, conserve, and improve access to local history materials at Brooks Memorial Library. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for hanging out with us, Thank Ms. Thank you. Star. It was a pleasure. All right, moving on. We move on to the Wyndham Regional Commission's Representative's Annual Report to the Select Board. Are you giving this report, Liz? I am. Oh, wait. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, having recently resigned my position with the Wyndham Regional Commission as Brattleboro's representative or commissioner. Um, I can tell you that, uh, well, Sue Fillion has prepared this report of the our yearly duties. And um, Sue and I have been the commissioners for the past year, and I've been the commissioner for a number of years, and um, they provide a lot of planning services to the region. Um, Brattleboro most specifically uses their GIS and mapping services. Um, but I'm, um, I always attended and actually was recently the chair of something called the Public Policy and Legislative Committee. And that's a very interesting committee because while the legislature is in session, all the legislators from Wyndham County come uh, one at a time on Mondays for meetings and the public is invited and everyone gets to hear the legislators and ask them questions, so it's very helpful. Um, and Sue comes to that sometimes. And then Sue is also on the Planning Coordination Committee, uh, which helps other towns with their, um, their town plans. Mm -hmm. And also, Sue works with the Wyndham Regional Commission on the Brownfields, which we already discussed. And uh, they're also working on pedestrian counts and West River Trail counts is something that the commission does for us. And they're involved in the Hinsdale Bridge. And they've also helped with, they had a renewable energy grant, which 
um, they helped Wyndham County um, deal and kind of elaborate on the state energy plan. And what else do they do? Oh, they helped with Red Clover Commons and a lot of housing partnerships. Uh, the New England New Theater received some brownfield funds, and they helped something called the Confluence Project, which is the Vermont Performance Lab and the Wyndham Regional Commission, the Planning Department, the Brattleboro Planning Department, and the Vermont River Conservancy, with collaborated with the Hilltop Montessori School to integrate arts and science. That's wonderful and quite extensive. Yes. So uh, now, as we discussed at our last meeting, Sue Fillion will return as a commissioner, and Tom Masakowski from the Planning Commission will join her. Excellent. Thank you. There's for no motion to be made. No motion to be made, and thank you for all of the work. A, a That's question. Wonderful. What's your question, David? Well, as I was reading this, and I read about the the renewable energy grant being awarded for rooftop solar at Red Clover Commons. And I wonder if um, Groundworks had applied for one of those grants. When they were in presenting, uh, one of us asked a question about whether they were planning rooftop solar or anything along those lines, and they s said that um, depending on what they could afford, mm -hmm. but it might be, uh, since I had forgotten about this money, mm -hmm. that I thought it was all gone by now, but it's not. And, and um, so I don't know who might want to contact the board of Groundworks. I don't know anybody that knows anybody yeah, at Groundworks. So I guess I'll follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll send Josh a message. Because I invited him to come back and ask us later on. But, mm -hmm. but this may, would be even better. They may have some other needs that, from us. Too. Okay. okay. Further questions or comments on the board? Questions or comments from the public? Um, <coughs> yes, Miss. I have, I have, oh, that's the next thing. Never mind. We'll see. Right over there. <laughs> okay, there is no action required, so we will move on to item J, which is the readoption of the Vermont Community Development Program Model Policy Update uh, for the Municipal Policy and Codes, which adds a whistleblower policy. Woo. Another, another exciting one for us this evening. Peter. This is an um, annual document that needs to be recertified. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. It needs to be recertified to the state um, for our continued participation in the VCDP program. Um, and from time to time, they add a new requirement. Um, the state has to comply with the federal requirements. This originates as federal money, um, comes to the state as block grant. Um, and then it's distributed through municipalities to local projects. And so um, so the, the state has to stay in compliance with the federal government's requirements. We have to stay in compliance with the state government's requirements. This year, what's before you tonight is identical to what it was last year, except that it um, has a, an additional policy near the end of it um, that does provide um, explicit protection to whistleblowers. Which is always a good thing to have in it a is policy. Indeed. Yep. I'm highly supportive of that. We recommend your approval. Okay. Questions or comments on the board? Whistleblowers are good. Whistleblowers are good. It's good Protecting to them be a good. whistleblower. Yeah. If needed. Questions or comments from the public? Ricky? Would you please read the additional whistleblower policy? And it also explain um, it. what the, the VCDP <laughs> is. What, was that what is the VCDP? That's the Vermont Community Development Program. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, whistleblower, whistleblower protections. A, the municipality shall not discriminate or retaliate against a municipal employee or agent for engaging in the following. One, providing to a public body a good faith report or good faith testimony that alleges an entity of municipal or state government, a municipal employee or official, or a person providing services to the municipality under contract has engaged in a violation of law or in waste, fraud, or abuse of authority or an act threatening health or safety. Two, assisting or participating in a proceeding to enforce the provisions of this policy. Would somebody like to do section B? <laughs> Leave it open. I'll be happy I do. to. 
You do? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Neither the municipality nor any municipal officer or employee shall attempt or restrict to restrict or interfere with in any manner a municipal employee's ability to engage in any of the protected activity described in subsection A of this policy. Employees are not required to report misconduct to the municipality or its agents prior to reporting to any governmental entity and or the public. Neither the municipality, this is item C, neither the municipality nor any municipal offer or employee shall require employees or agents to forego monetary awards as a result of such reports. And that's it. That's it. And that's it. My question for clarification would be, do agents include the non-employees, like people who are uh, volunteers on committees? Are they considered agents? That's a question for the town attorney. I don't know technically. Anybody yeah. that we hire to perform a function on behalf of the town, contract with them to do that, is an agent of the town. I, I don't know if technically under the law a volunteer committee member would be an agent of the town. So are you saying that this policy doesn't cover protection for committee members? I, I'm not no. saying that. I'm saying we need to confer with the town attorney to know whether um, committee members come under that umbrella of the term agent. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Good thing to know. I, I noticed that they probably mean municipal officer in this mm. spot right here. So I'll make that change before oh, we yeah. sign. Well, at the very it's least, the, the uh, uh, we're yeah. just there, like residents. No we're just people. So like if, the, if it's coverage for <clears throat> all whistleblowers, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Further questions or comments on this policy addition? Adoption. Okay, then I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt the policy entitled Municipal Policies and Codes, also known as Form MP1, as presented. All right, there's a motion to adopt the policy entitled Municipal Policies and Codes, as presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Our business. That ends our business for this evening. Um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. I didn't adjourn it by myself. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, BCTV. You need it. Yeah. All right. It was a long agenda, but I Like there's one in the signature. So, Janet has some whistleblower.